one. All right, welcome. We have a esteemed panel tonight, a bunch of uh, good guys, and we're going to be talking about the uh, debate. We're going to do a review. Uh, we've got multiple people here. Everybody's links are below, except for David. I apologize, David. I need to add the link to your channel. I'll do that here in a second while we're all talking. But before we get going, let's make sure that everybody can hear us so we don't talk for 30 minutes uh, when we can't be heard. Can uh, everybody hear me okay? If you will, let me, if you can, let me know. Type something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can they hear us? Are they typing? I'm looking in the comment section. I'm saying yeah. no response yet. Yeah, they go hear you. So they go, yeah, right. they hear you. Can you guys hear them? Hello, oh. hello, hello. The gamer hello. has arrived. <laughs> hello, David. Hey. Hello. Hi. Okay. Hello. Okay, so we have uh, our panel tonight. We've got Dr. Bo Branson, who will be speaking to us, kind of giving his take on um, what he saw in the debate and then the uh, speciality that he has in terms of the monarchia of the father, uh, amongst other areas. He's also a, an analytical philosopher, so we're going to be hearing from Dr. Bo. We've also got Father Deacon Dr. Ananias. We've got uh, uh, our good friend Sam Shamoon with us. We've got our... Uh, our friend Kai and Lewis. We've got Snack, David, the real Med White, and I think that's everybody. So um, first off, we're going to kick it off with uh, Dr. Branson. If you would, you know, one of the things that's become uh, evident to us as we engage with not just the Roman Catholic or the Unitarian or uh, some of the strands of, of Protestantism is that we get what you you hone in on. We get this equalitarian. Uh, view of the mm -hmm. Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But what you've really shown in your lectures is the importance uh, that Orthodox theology has always stressed, which is the monarchia of the Father. And in right. fact, there's many, many texts, especially in the Gospel of John, where Jesus defers to the Father, that he comes to honor the Father, to do the mission of the Father. So maybe you could give us uh, a rundown, if you would, of your research into this and why the monarchy of the Father is such an important dogma. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons you just hit on, which is just trying to understand what the scriptures uh, say about God. So one of the things that I noticed that really um, seems to get a lot of people kind of... Um, the mission of the Father. So maybe you could give us... Uh, sorry, I can hear, I'm hearing uh, echoing, if you would an mute, echo yeah. of you from like two I'm minutes ago. Father's such an important dogma. Maybe maybe this is like Infinity War. Or <laughs> yeah. You're in a time loop so if, or something. <laughs> yeah, if you're not talking, if you would mute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, anyway, so you know, one thing that that uh, animates a lot of of Unitarians is they they only get this kind of egalitarian picture of the Trinity and. Uh, something that, you know, I think in popular kind of evangelical circles, a lot of times the view of the Trinity is either it is just a thinly veiled modalism or it's something that's kind of tantamount to modalism. And that's what they get. And that's what they really think is like the doctrine of the Trinity. And then they go to the Bible and it's like, well, here, God's just the father, like all through the New Testament, you know, it looks like the word God just kind of refers to the father. And that throws them for a loop, and then they just decide to kind of abandon the doctrine of the Trinity altogether, and uh, I'll just say Jesus is a human, and, you know, we'll just kind of move on. Um, and so I think that's one of the, the big problems is that you, you really, uh, if, you, if you take this more egalitarian approach, you're going to be thrown for a loop when you, when you go to the scriptures. And that's one of the things that Augustine, uh, it's kind of a move that he made that I think was... A mistake is is in order to respond to these Arian objections about you know Jesus calling the Father the only true God. He says, well, that's really the Trinity. Like whenever we hear the you know God in the Bible, it's just the Trinity as a whole. And I think that kind of gave him a certain response. It, it helped him with some certain arguments, but I think it's it's ultimately kind of a mistake. Um, and so um, one one of the things also. Uh, that it helps us do is kind of understand monotheism. So um, if you think about it in the very earliest centuries of Christianity, um, 
people didn't really talk about, they, they didn't use the word monotheism, they just used the word monarchia. So if you read like Tertullian and old, you know, apologetics against the modalists, um, they don't say, oh, they're really concerned about monotheism. They say they're really concerned about the monarchia and they, they want to collapse all the persons to preserve the monarchia. Um, so there's this kind of equation, even, even in, up into the fourth century, when people would say to St. Basil, they'd say, hey, you're a tritheist because you've got these three distinct persons and they've all got the divine nature. He, he didn't say like, well you know, they're all kind of one, but they're kind of three, and it's real complicated, and, you know, they're all sort of God as a whole, whatever. What he responded, uh, the way he responded was he said, there's one God because there's one Father. Uh, and so, again, it was the sword because there's one sort of ultimate first principle. That's the sense in which there's only one God. Uh, and one, actually, one of the things that got me into this, believe it or not, I really didn't think about this issue at all when I was writing my dissertation on the Trinity. I was kind of thinking uh, more about other other issues, and um, and actually, I didn't even really think at the time that it was problematic to just say, "Okay, yeah, God is the Father." It didn't didn't really occur to me that there's you know there's this kind of confusion out there, um, uh, and partly maybe that's I, I converted to orthodoxy like. 20 something years ago or something. So I was kind of like a teenager when I, so it's been a long time since I've been in, in the, the crowd that sort of wants to conflate everything and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So I didn't really think much about it until I realized there's this whole kind of Unitarian subculture out there that really thinks this is this big issue. And one of the things that I did, um, besides kind of going back to Gregory of Nyssa, who is kind of who I focused on in my dissertation is, Actually, I, I got interested in Theodore Abukura, who was the first, um, uh, he's the first Christian theologian to write in Arabic um, after the rise of Islam. So John of Damascus probably knew Arabic and he knew about Islam and talked about it and everything, but he wrote in Greek because that was still kind of the lang language of culture and learning and what other Christians would be reading. Um, and the interesting thing is, um, Theodore Abukura had this uh, kind of language. He would say, God and his logos and his spirit are one God. Um, so he didn't say like the one God is the Trinity or whatever. And I thought, oh, that's interesting because I, I noticed that Gregory of Nyssa does uh, some similar things. So one thing a lot of people don't notice, there's a classic, um, it's listed as St. Basil's 38th epistle, but it was probably really written by Gregory of Nyssa to his brother, Peter was kind of this classic exposition of the difference between usia and hypostasis. And what people don't notice is he lists the three persons of the Trinity uh, in reverse order. He says there's the Holy Spirit, and then there's the Son, and then there's God. <laughs> and, uh, and people don't notice that. They think, well, that's not what it should say, so they kind of read past that or whatever. And the interesting thing is, you know, they each have kind of their own distinct quality. So he says the distinct property of the Holy Spirit is that he's revealed after the Son and together with the Son. He has his hypostasis from the Father. And then the Son comes in an only begotten manner from the Father. And then he says, then there's God. That's the first person of the Trinity. And his distinct quality is to be a father. Uh, and so it's interestingly, that's, uh, and uh, another thing that, that I noticed then was, uh, you know, you go back to Arius, the actual text of the condemnation of Arius, what Arius was really famous for was saying there was a time when the sun was not. There was a time when the sun didn't exist. And that, uh, that was his big slogan. So you would think that that would be the first thing that they would list of, you know, his heresies. But actually, it comes kind of further down the list. And the number one thing that they list of the heresies that he's, uh, that he's involved in is they say, uh, according to Arius, there was a time when God was not the father. Uh, and so, of course, the opposite of that is not that, well, the one God is really the whole Trinity all smushed together or something like that. The opposite of that is just to say God is is the father and has always been the father and, and is eternally a father. Um, and so I started noticing things like that and things in the kind of early encounter between orthodoxy and Islam and the way people talk. Another thing I noticed was just the Quran itself. Um, 
you know, describes the doctrine of the Trinity by saying that uh, Christians believe that God is one of three. Uh, and Western scholars will routinely just say like, oh, well, Muhammad, this guy is just an idiot. You know, he didn't know that God is supposed to be all three sort of together. But but when you actually look at the early Christians that were talking with with the Muslims, that that actually is how they describe it. They say, yeah, there's God and then his logos and his spirit. And those together kind of are one God. They kind of count as one God. But they use the when they're using the word God to refer to something, it just refers to the Father. Um, and so I don't know. I can talk a little bit about that if you want. I don't know. I want to take too long, but that's just uh, some things that kind of it, it impressed me. Right. And I noticed. And I thought, well, it's maybe important to to lay something about this out. Well, no, but, yeah, please do because what I noticed there is that the 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 person of the Father is. Is yeah. the beginning of our ordo theologia. The order of our yeah. theology begins with the person of the Father, and mm -hmm. then the deity that He communicates is the secondary right. sense of the term God. Right. So, yeah. does Jesus possess divinity? Yes, uh, yeah. but that divinity that He possesses is derivative of the divine Father who communicates right. that to Him. A communication right. that's proper to the Father's essence. Right. But as you're pointing out, there is a particular picking out that's specific for the proper term God, and that's the hypostasis of the Father. And that's so crucial when we contrast this with, as you pointed out, what would become the norm in the Augustinian tradition, what, we, what you get in Thomas Aquinas, what you get all the way up until Gilson, where Gilson says, you know, Exodus 3 isn't the Father stating his uh, self-revelatory personhood, but it's uh, I am that I am equals supreme essence, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe you could comment yeah. further on that because that really does start our whole order of theology off differently. Yeah, I think, like I said, um, I think that Augustine is the first person to kind of verbally make a shift uh, from having God refer instead of to the Father, to the whole Trinity. And I think he does that because it gives him a certain response to some of his critics but even there, I would say that the interesting thing, and something I've done some more research kind of lately on like, where does this egalitarian view kind of originate? I think for Augustine, it's really just kind of this verbal shift, but he still will say that the father is the source the of the whole principle. The cause, yeah. Yeah, exactly. He even says things like he says, you know, the son is God from God. Uh, the spirit is God from God, but only the father is God just sort of God, period, not God from God. Uh, so even there you get that. And then even uh, I noticed like in the Athanasian Creed, there's still kind of this thing that the father is a nulo. He's from no one, but the son and the spirit are a patre. So they're from another. Uh, Thomas Aquinas still has the father being the first principle and so forth. And it's really, you know, it's so famously in the fourth Lateran Council, uh, you get this, second uh canon or whatever where they say there's this divine basically the divine essence is kind of this being this reality that has no source principle without it, principle yeah the source yeah so it's really like it's the the monarchy of the divine essence at that point uh, but even then like thomas aquinas and others will say like no the father is the principle so it's kind right. of a, it's like a dual position at once yeah, I mean, it gets a little ambiguous and kind of weird, but uh, then it, it seems that uh, Calvin is the first person actually to say that Christ is out of theos. So up until that point, from origin on up, origin kind of made this distinction by saying, well, the son is theos and the spirit is theos, but only the father is out of theos. He's God of himself. And then the son and the spirit kind of are given the divine nature by the father eternally. And so they, they have the divine nature. They have it from the father was the father just has it from himself. So he, he used the term auto theos to make that distinction. And Calvin's the first person to say that the son and the spirit are also auto theos. And it appeared, the interesting thing is it appears even there that he kind of didn't mean it. <laughs> So he got into he got into a lot of trouble. There's this whole you can read books about the the Autothean controversy. Um, people were saying like, well, it's kind of tritheistic, whatever. 
But what he really did is he made this distinction between the essence and the hypostasis. And he says, well, the essence is unoriginate. It's ase. And then the father gives that essence to the son and the spirit. So he says, says the son and the spirit are hypostatically, um, they're not ase. They're from the father. But their essence just is the father's essence. And so it's ase. And so they're out of this. And that's it. So even there, it looks like even Calvin doesn't really think like the son and the spirit are absolutely Asse. But it appears that uh, kind of in the later reformed tradition, people either misinterpreted Calvin or they just wanted the persons to be more equal for theological reasons or whatever. And so they kind of took that even even further. And so now you've right. got people like William Lane Craig and, and so forth that, that will say like the three persons are all a uh, say, um, in which case to me, it's like, well, it's not, it's not really a father and a son. <laughs> if, yeah, exactly. If they're, they're, they're really like, well, they're not even brothers. I mean, they're just kind of like three buddies that are all, you know, kind of happen to be alike or something. Um, so, yeah. So, and I, it, I mean, to me, that seems like tritheism. I mean, yeah, I don't it would mean that. the father communicates his hypostatic property to the son and to the spirit. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, aseity is supposed to be the father's, um, yeah, the father's individual properties, hypostatic property. So, yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it's not consistent with Cappadocian metaphysics of the Trinity. Right. Um, and it sure looks like tritheism. Um, so yeah, that's that's some more things that I've noticed um, lately. So I, I think it's important for us, I mean, especially as Orthodox Christians, it's important for us to kind of see that because the Great Schism really came about because of the issue of the monarchy of the Father. People, um, in, in, if you don't, you know, if you're not really into theology really deep or whatever, if you're just reading secondary sources, everybody knows the Filioque had something to do with it, but they try to downplay the importance and say it was more about papal authority or something like this. But if you look at things like the acts of the council of, of, you know, Lyon and Florence, they they spent like a a fraction of the time talking about papal authority. And they spent this huge portion of the time talking about the filioque. And if you read Photius, uh, St. Photius's uh, mystagogy of the Holy spirit, um, it, I mean, it's true that he gets into metaphysics and there's a lot of st- that stuff that's kind of abstract, but the basic point is very simple, which is just if you've got two first principles, you've got two gods. Exactly. And and so you, you've got to either interpret the filioque in such a way that it doesn't really mean that the son is a first principle. Um, he's not really a source of the Holy Spirit's existence. Um or it looks like you've got two gods and that's just, um, that's heresy, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Excellent. Lewis, do you want well, to take over the up. emceeing now? Yeah, sure, sure. So I wanted to just chuck a couple of Shabir's, Ali's um, objections he had, uh, that, which I think were answered in the debate, but, uh, and then I'll hand it over to Kai right afterwards because it, because it all ties into the monarchy thing. Mm. Um, so... Uh, one of Shabir's arguments was that, well, you have three persons, and then you have the essence, so then you have four gods. Mm-hmm. What do you think of that? <laughs> oh, what did I think about that? Yeah, what did you think oh, of that? Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, I guess I could see why you might think three. I thought it was odd that it would be four, also, so that seems like the essence is just obviously in a different category. But one thing that I realized, so this is something I, I realized years ago when I was doing my dissertation, is um, part of the the motivation for Augustine to move in a more egalitarian sort of direction is Augustine doesn't recognize um, really a distinction between the essence and the energies. Uh, and if you look at Gregory Amen. of Nyssa... Nissan- thank you for... <laughs> Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Do you agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, because he has this kind of extreme, like Neoplatonic sort of view of divine simplicity. So that so for Augustine, um, he has to sort of admit to the Arians that the word God, when it's used as a predicate, predicates the divine nature of a thing, right? 
Uh, but Gregory of Nyssa's response to the the threeness, the three gods objection, was to to say that the word God does not predicate the divine nature. That's not a predicate that expresses the divine nature. It expresses one of God's energies, not even all of God's energies, just one particular divine energy. That's really uh, important. And, yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah, um, maybe you can uh, elaborate if you want. But his, so I mean, uh, Gregory, to just finish it, Gregory's response, and this is what my dissertation was all about, was just to say there's a kind of metaphysical phenomenon where the persons of the Trinity all are able to act as a single agent. Their their individual actions are uh, are not individuated. So it's what in in Latin they call the inseparable operations. Which, weirdly enough, um, Augustine does talk about the inseparable operations at some points. Um, so he's, he still has that view. But, but uh, for Gregory, he just says, um, how many beings with the divine nature there are is, is irrelevant. Um, the question is how many activities there are. So a, an analogy I can give, I give sometimes is uh, if you said, like, there's one king in Israel, Right. So let's say it's King David is the one king in Israel. Then he has a son, Solomon, who has the same nature. He's a human being. Right. That doesn't mean there's two kings um, because the word king doesn't express the human nature. It's it's an activity. Kinging, you know, lording or whatever is something that you do. And that's something that can be shared, right? So, for example, I just bought a house recently and I gave power of attorney to my realtor and when she walked into the closing and people said where's the buyer um people pointed at my realtor and said she's the buyer um and i mean in some sense that's true she was buying the house she's <laughs> she was the one who was actually signing documents um and and actually buying the house but yeah. she was buying but it she... in my name with my authority that i shared with her right it and, doesn't and possess also, the 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 essence of buyerhood <laughs> yeah, well, she, ha I mean, we do. So we both have the human nature. We both have the same mm -hmm. nature. Um, but you wouldn't say that there's two buyers. Um, so, you know, if you were selling a house and you, you literally had two buyers, you could play them against each other. You could say, hey, this guy offered this much. How much can you offer? Right. So mm -hmm. if you, if you had told the seller, hey, congratulations, you've got a second buyer. <laughs> Now you can start a bidding war. Well, you would have misled you would have misled the seller, right? If you mm -hmm. said there's two buyers, um, the reality is there's just one buyer, and it's me, mm -hmm. right? But it's also true that she's the buyer in in the sense that uh, she has the buying authority. I've shared the the buying power with her, and and she participates in that, and she she yeah. has that power. Um, so it's not false to say that she's the buyer, but it's also the case that there's just one buyer and it's me. <laughs> and, <laughs> one and, concern and, with God, right? There's only one sort of king of the universe. Yeah. Um, it's true that Jesus is also the king because he shares that authority with the, with the father. right? Um, and he shares the divine nature with the father. But it's also the case that there's only the one king ultimately. I'm sorry to interject, but I want to add a point in regards to what Dr. Shabir Lee's point was. I believe what he was trying to say is that he considered in his mind that the persons of the Trinity were parts and that they yeah. formed a whole. And yeah, that becomes yeah. they formed a whole. There's a quaternity. Now, yeah. interestingly, right, yeah. this is actually a historical position that some people had before Islam even existed. Mm -hmm. um, this is a dispute between two anti-Chalcedonians, Damian of Alexandria and Peter of Antioch, where Damian of Alexandria points out that he says, well, we don't say there are three gods. There's one God and all the persons participate in that divinity. Now, this is not the position that yeah. we hold, but actually, yeah. if Dr. Shabrili pointed out to Damian of Alexandria, he will be right. There yeah. will be four gods in his. But this yeah, is something yeah. that people did hold, but they didn't hold it in the traditional Orthodox Church. This was more in the anti-Chalcedonian route that they took because of their Christological presuppositions. So I just want to add that because yeah. it kind of connects with the topic yeah. and Dr. Lee's critique. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask um, just one concern real quick that a lot of people have uh, when they listen to your your emphasis, uh, Dr. Branson, is a lot of them are 
wondering like okay but in our liturgy we call the son god and we call the spirit sure. god and we and we and then we call you know the, the fathers call them god on a lot of occasions scripture calls them uh god so um a lot of people are kind of like yeah you're confusing me uh dr yeah. branson so there's probably a couple of different questions there that people might be having one is kind of a linguistic question like what what licenses us calling Jesus God if he's not the father uh, and the father is the one God? Another a different question might be something about like the divine nature, like doesn't uh, isn't Jesus supposed to have the divine nature? So um, the second question, I guess, about the divine nature, I just kind of tried to explain just just then. Right. So you can have um, the, the word God doesn't necessarily mean a being with the divine nature. That's kind of, a, and, and by the way, Gregory of Nyssa's move there to say that's not what it means. That's not original with him. That's the tradition up to his point. So if you look in, you can find in Theophilus of Antioch and Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and all these guys, when it, when it comes up and, they, and they're not defending like a full blown doctrine of the Trinity because this is before the fourth century. So it, but it does come up a few times and they, they just say the word God is not uh, a name that expresses the divine nature. It, it expresses this activity. Um, but a second issue is sort of, okay, well, so what licenses us in, in calling Christ God? Um, so I would say two things. I mean, so one is just in a very literal sense, right? He has that energy uh, by nature. So, uh, in, in sort of the same way, you can call my realtor the buyer, um, or if a king had a son and made his son the vice regent, you would call him the king. Um, so same thing. But there's another, there, there's another response, there's another aspect to it that um, people probably will not hear from Protestants um, because it, it conflicts with, with later with, with Protestant theology. Uh, and that is, um, and this is in St. Basil, right? It's the theology of the icon. Um, so I can point to, if I've got a photograph of my wife over here on, on my desk, uh, if my wife isn't here in the room and you want to see my wife, I can say, that's my wife, right? So I just point over here and I say, this is my wife. Um <clears throat> I'm not saying anything false if I point to the photograph and say, that's my wife, right? I'm, I'm expressing a truth, right? But you wouldn't say, oh, Dr. Branson, I had no idea you're a bigamist, right? I didn't know you, <laughs> I didn't know orthodoxy was, was okay with multiple wives, you know? I know you've got a human wife downstairs here, you know, somewhere. So, um, uh, you know, we, we understand there's just the one wife and then there's the image of the wife, right? Uh, but we treat a representation as though it is the thing that it represents, right? So I can say, um, I can point to it and say, that's my wife. She's my wife. I can even say, this is my human wife. Like, that is my one true wife. Because when I point to the representation, the reference transfers to the actual, to the prototype. And that's something St. Basil says, because the the Eunomians accuse and they say, hey, you're, you're worshiping three uh, different gods. I mean, you're, you're at least triolatrous, even if you manage to be monotheistic, you're triolatrous. And he says, uh, no, because the honor shown to the image passes over to the prototype, right? And that's where we get the Seventh Ecumenical Council and the theology about, about icons. And because Christ is the icon of the invisible God, right? So uh, we can't see God the Father, he's invisible, but Christ is this visible icon that's a representation of God. And so it's completely true to say, this is God, just like if I pointed a photograph of my wife, say, that's my wife. Um, and if I, uh, if I kiss a photo of my wife, I mean, I'm doing that to show affection to my wife, not to show affection to a physical piece of paper or something. But that, of course, was the basis of, of the, the decision at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And so when people don't like the Seventh Ecumenical Council, they have to kind of chop off that aspect of traditional Trinitarian theology. And they, 
they can't make that work anymore. Mm. I'm going to get uh, Snack to comment, Sam to comment, yeah. and then Kai can do his uh, little speech, and then we'll probably uh, jump to maybe something more scriptural so we can get Sam, who's our other oh. um, keynote speaker here, to say some stuff. Yeah. Who's speaking um, now? So Snack, uh, then Sam, then Kai. Are going to get into debate as a whole, or uh, just uh, this point you, uh, you, you just brought up uh, about the, the four persons? Sorry? Uh, you mean uh, the live as a whole, or the point you've just uh, brought up? Oh, uh, just, just uh, yeah, the point, or yeah, the point, or the live as a whole, oh, yeah. up to you. Uh, for this point specifically, I think it was maybe targeting um, people who were um, um, brought up with this representation of the Trinity that is, um, you know, the the classic shield. Uh, yeah, it's very famous, and 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 this one is a representation that I don't personally like because. I find it a bit misleading because ultimately, yes, you you, you will see the, the um, four um, four main ideas that are equated. Uh, I don't think that's a, that's a. I mean, obviously, you cannot just represent the Trinity because uh, it, it is it is way beyond the reach. But um, in here, it was probably uh, commenting on that and maybe trying to uh, to target uh, some uh, maybe more Western audiences. Go ahead, Sam. Oh, I thought he's asking a question for response. I'm sorry. I was waiting. <laughs> I apologize. I had a hard time. Yeah, I, I need, I just want to ask the, the distinguished doctor and praise the Lord Jesus that I'm in this very <clears throat> amazing gathering. I'm learning about Orthodox theology. As you know, my background's on Orthodox, but I'm learning. I've already come to the conclusion, the mar monarchy of the father is biblical and historical, but I just want some clarification for us who are just being exposed to Orthodox understanding, uh, because many of us, like I said, in the channel, I, I know there are people who are not from an Orthodox background. You said Jesus is God in activity and energy, because the word God doesn't refer to the essence, but to the energy of God. And you said that Jesus is God because he's the image of God. But just again, so that there is no confusion and that we're tracking along and understanding what you're saying properly. So he's not just God by virtue of being the image of God or God in activity, because in Western theology, there's a distinction between the ontological Trinity and the economic Trinity. Mm -hmm. Jesus is God in activity. But you are saying Jesus does possess the divine essence or am I? Yeah, so I absolutely. He possesses divine essence. And, and I wouldn't say that Jesus is God in activity. Um, I just would say there's an activity that, originates from god the father but jesus participates in that right so all three of the persons of the trinity participate in the same activities yeah so an, an example would uh, an example gregory nissa gives is like creation right there's only one universe and so there's only one act of creation that action of creation and it's kind of a weird i mean this is a little bit of a weird metaphysics but i get into that in my dissertation but the the father son and holy spirit all jointly do that one act of creation does that make sense so it's not that jesus yeah. like is god in action some it's there there are three real persons there but they all jointly act in order to affect any yeah. particular could I, could I add something here, too? There's yeah. a great statement in John Damascus where he looks back to, I think, Gregor Nazianzus, and he points out in uh, Book 3, the Exposition, Section 15, where he says that the uh, energy signifies the type of nature that's present or there. So mm -hmm. since the Son possesses the same energy as the Father, he yeah. deduces that they have the same essence. Um, yeah, that goes back to the Cappadocians. Exactly, too, so. because Basil made the argument that one way that we can know that the Holy Spirit is fully divine is that he possesses the same energy and therefore the same nature. Okay. Now, in light of what you just said, what if Shabir were to come back? And I'm just, it's hypothetical. I don't think Shabir would be able to track along with uh, all these brilliant insights. Praise God for your minds. May the Lord sharpen it for his glory. You just said that the activity <clears throat> pretty much presupposes the essence. So now we're back to the activity of the Son shows that He's divine in nature. The activity of the Holy Spirit shows that He's divine in nature. And the activity of the Father shows He's divine in nature. So then, yes. could Shabir say, well, we're back to the same conundrum. Three persons, one nature. 
So, yeah, I mean, it's true. There's there's three persons in one nature. Does that mean there's three gods? Well, only if the word God meant a being with the divine nature. Uh, no, before Augustine, nobody really thinks that. Um, they, they think the word God doesn't mean a being with a certain nature. They, they think it means a being who does a certain kind of activity. So, so think about it this way, like, um, you know, president of the United States doesn't mean that you're homo sapiens, right? Or else we'd all be the president. Um, mm -hmm. And, and in, you know, theoretically, if there's intelligent aliens or something, you know, we give them citizenship, like we, you know, we could have E.T. being a, a president uh, of the United States. So president is something you do. It's, it's an activity that you that you engage in. Um, and that's how they see God. In other words, the word God is more like the word Lord or the word King. Um, and so the number of Kings of the universe, let's say, or rulers of the universe is not the number of beings that share the same nature or essence as the father. It's just sort of how many rulers are there uh, or how many sources of the universe are there. And I think for Muslims, if they want to argue that their definition of God is more accurate, then they will have a weird definition because the definition includes being the source of, you know, rational principle of the universe and just being the source itself. Yeah. And so if they want to have this weird definition, then they will actually attack their own God <laughs> because then, OK, uh, being God doesn't mean that you're the source of all uh, principles and whatnot. Uh, we just exclude that just to make Christians look Bad. Right, right, that doesn't yeah. make any sense yeah it will make them look bad mm -hmm. yeah another thing that gregory of nissa points out is just it's just completely incompatible with the bible so there's all these things you know the gods of the gentiles are demons the demons don't have the divine nature uh moses mm -hmm. says he's a god to pharaoh but he you can't give him the divine nature so there's all these you know cases where the word god you know paul even says there be gods many and lords many Jesus says, you know, I have said ye are gods, all of you sons of the most high. So there's clearly uh, the word God is being used in some sense that that can't be predicating the divine nature. Um, you know, I mean, you can say, well, it's kind of an equivocal use that's, you know, they're different from the one God or something. But um, but it just doesn't look like the word God means a being with such and such essence or nature. It looks like it's a being that that does something. Mm -hmm. I can ask one final question for, for clarification, because you just said the, the term God is the activity that the being engages in, essence, the being and essence. So you said God is an activity. There's that being who then <clears throat> engages in that activity, right? There's an activity that this being engages in. That activity is what you call God. But now in that being, how many persons are there? Um, so strictly speaking, I would say, um, so to say something like X is God, it just sort of means that X participates in an action, in a certain kind of action, right? So like being president, to say X is the president or X is the king means this person is doing a certain kind of activity, right? Um, why would we not count three individual, three distinct persons uh, as three distinct rulers? Well, if they're sharing a common authority, if they're sharing a common power, uh, then it would just be misleading to say there's three kings, right? If, if I said, um, oh, I think, where is it? It's like, I forget what country it is now, but I mean, I think there is a country that has like seven presidents or something. They have this kind of council, right? That's like the the highest executive is actually a council of like seven people um, and they can disagree and they have to vote on things and so forth. That seems like a case where you've got seven rulers, right? Like you've got people with distinct wills. Um, they have to vote on things. They can disagree. There might be conflict. Um, but if you've got, let's say, you know, ultimately just a monarch, and then he's got his son who is his vice regent, but he and his son are exactly alike in every way. They have the same will. 
they couldn't possibly disagree and so forth. Um, it doesn't seem like there's multiple rulers. It seems like there's right. just Maybe one. In the future, yeah. the in the future session, we'll engage this because I want to keep on Shabir, but you got me interested. We got to talk more. So <laughs> well, on your right, we'll, Let's we'll focus talk. on Shabir. Excellent. Uh, yeah, go yes. ahead, Kai. Launch us in. Launch us in, Kai. Launch us in as we slowly creep up to the actual debate topic. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but indulge, indulge me in my little filibuster here. Uh, because before we begin the debate review proper, I would just like to say a few words about the general overarching theme and approach with regards to Orthodox Christian and Islamic apologetics. So this matter goes beyond the Jay Dyer, Dr. Shabir Ali debate. All right, so please indulge me as we look at how we as Orthodox Christians envision apologetics with Muslims in a wider scope. So Abu Mansur Muhammad bin Muhammad bin Mahmud al-Samarkandi, also known as Abu Mansur al-Maturidi, was a Muslim who lived in the 9th and 10th centuries of the Christian era. The Kalamic school that bears his name is followed by a vast portion of the Muslim Ummah. Together, the Maturidi and the Sha'ari schools represent the creeds or aqaid of the majority of the Muslims. The greatest work of Maturidi is his Kitab al tawhid or the Book of Oneness and Unity of Allah. In it, he discusses the divinity of Christ and especially cites his perceptions, albeit incorrect, of the Orthodox Christian position as well as positions of the Monophysites and Nestorians. By doing so, what Maturidi is doing is he's making it explicitly clear that discussing Christ is fundamentally related to discussing Tawheed. So even the Islamic notion of Christ as the quote-unquote word of Allah or Christ coming into creation as a result of Allah saying be is fundamentally a question of Tawheed. As Abu Abdullah Muhammad bin Yusuf al-Sanusi al-Husayni al-Maliki, most known for the Aqidah Sanusiyah, makes it clear in his Um al brahin or source of evidence or source of proofs, it is incumbent on every Muslim, including Dr. Shabir Ali, to become knowledgeable in Islam, each according to their degree. He echoes Surah 58, verse 11 of the Quran. يَرْفَعِي أَلَّهُ أَلَّذِينَ أَمَّنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُطْعُوا الْعِلْمُ دَرَجَةً so Allah will raise up in rank or degrees those of you who believe and have been given knowledge. So therefore, belief on one hand is not jointed from knowledge on the other, but rather the two go hand in hand. So when Muhammad proclaims the verse, Qul hu Allahu ahad, say he is Allah, the one and only, he was not teaching anything new. The Nicene Creed of the Christians in Syriac begins, Muhammadan Bahad Allah. We believe in one God. Muhammadan Bahad Allah, Qul Hu Allahu Ahad. So the apologetics between Christianity and Islam are not that we believe in one God, but how we believe in that one God. In other words, the debate is about paradigms. The debate is not about or so much about manuscripts, textual criticism, so-called contradictions, and so on. Those do exist, and orthodoxy can stand its ground on all these fronts. Rather, from the orthodox perspective, the debate is ultimately about which paradigm can more satisfactorily justify the oneness and unity of God. Mm. And in order to have this discussion, Muslims must start defending their aqidah, something that Dr. Shabir Ali explicitly refused to do. Now, what does it mean for Muslims to defend their aqidah? It means to defend the notion of Islamic Tawheed. And how does one defend Tawheed? With the Kalam. So rattling off verses from the Quran that God is one is not defending Tawheed. It is merely stating an element of Tawheed. Now, 
Muslims expect Christians to defend the doctrine of the Holy Trinity to the minutest theological detail and scrutiny, yet themselves special plead not having to utter a single word with respect to Tawheed beyond simply stating that God is one. Muslims believe that God is one because the Quran says so. Well, while we as Christians have no problem in saying that God is one, we as Christians do not believe in the Quran as a divine book or divine revelation. So the Muslim assertion is completely meaningless. It is not an argument. And it may shock many Muslims to learn that Islam, in fact, does not have a coherent or unified understanding of Tawheed. The notion of Tawheed is not as clear cut that you simply just read the Quran and you understand what Tawheed means. If you study the Kalam in the foundational period of Islam, then you'll realize the concept of God's oneness and unity is not something that Islam can adequately answer. But then you also have on the other extreme, uh, extreme uh, people like the Salafis, Wahhabis, Ibn Taymiyyans, who will dismiss Kalam altogether. What that serves to do is just an immediate admission of defeat that Islamic Tawheed in itself is not defendable. Well, to the intellect, at least, it's not defendable. So it goes completely contrary to what Dr. Shabir Ali stated. So the matter is not a dead issue of the Middle Ages settled long ago. Islamic Tawheed is very much alive and relevant topic of debate to the day. But even if it was a settled issue in Islam, now Islam has to defend it from scrutiny, from orthodoxy, from the orthodox perspective. But what Dr. Shabir Ali did, he refused to defend Tawheed. In other words, he refused to defend the very core belief of Islam, the oneness and unity of Allah. So you have here one of the world's most famous apologists, Muslim apologists, that could not defend against the Christian the core beliefs of Islam. So those Muslims who are watching, think about that. Let that sink in. So as just to continue on the train of thought to sum up here, I'm just about done. As Maturidi demonstrates, discussion of Christ is not merely an isolated discussion limited to Christ alone. Christ is fundamental to understanding Tawheed. So you as Muslims cannot logically discuss Christ without discussing Tawheed, which entails discussing things like the Safat, Qadr, Iqtisab, Tanzih, and so on. So we as Orthodox Christians challenge Muslims to directly defend the doctrine of Islamic Tawheed. We implore you to attempt to defend in debate the fundamental core belief of Islam. We want you to debate your Aqidah. Thank you. Lewis, if you yeah. want to continue. Yeah, what I'm going to say is I'm going to let some people make some comments on what you've said. Uh, and then we've had we've done a lot of philosophy uh, so far. So I'm going to pull it back to the to the scripture. And uh, we'll talk about one of Shabir's Absolutely. kind of main meaty arguments he's been doing for the past decades. Um, and we'll launch into Sam for that. But just any comments on what Kai said? Um, oh. Yeah, I'd like to, to comment because uh, obviously being in France, we've been uh, faced with some Muslim debates. And and there's, there's one thing, and Kai is... This is very relevant. There's one thing that we always bring up. First of all, you have to destroy their unity because they claim they're unified and they all have a different creed. They all have a different way to view uh, not only God, but the Quran itself. Um, and the first thing you need to, to, to ask them is to uh, yeah, uh, disclose your Akida. And oftentimes they don't even know that uh, there are different Akidas. They will maybe know the jurisprudential school, you know, uh, to, to be sure if they can eat um, uh, seafood or not. Uh, but uh, apart from that, they will, they will uh, n never engage like this and they will um, flee philosophy. And this is even more damaging because uh, their main argument is saying that the Kalam is um, the, uh, ta tawid, the, simpl uh, the, the Tawid, the simplicity, the absolute simplicity of God is evident, is self-evident. So it is so evident that they don't even want to engage with it. Uh, and that's that's one of the uh, of, of the biggest problem, and that, that's what happened with uh, in the debate. The entire uh, beginning of, uh, of of the debate was uh, Shabir Ali saying, "Oh, it, it is very evident. We can see it in the Old Testament. We can see it even in the New Testament. It's it, it makes more sense." And when Jay simply asked, "How does it make sense? Explain it to me," <laughs> he said, "Back off," and that's um, that's that's a big problem. 
And I wanted to make a second comment, and Kwai was very um, <coughs> right in pointing this. Um, Islamic theology is a, a, an anti-Christian theology. It's based on the criticism of Christianity. You can see it in the Quran uh, directly. You can see it in, in, the, in the scholars. Um, but they are faced with the, with the same problem because when they try to engage with um, with all paradigm, uh, they, they, they face the same problem. So, for example, at the time of St. John of Damascus, he explains that the Muslims still consider that the word of God is Christ. Uh, and nowadays, they will say that the word of God is a Quran, uh, which uh, leads them to Christological problems. So basically, the Christological problems become Quranological problems. It, it, it becomes part of the chronology of how they see the Quran. And, and we will explain this a bit later, but the position that Dr. Ali took is... Uh, um, borderline in terms of uh, of maturity uh, chronology yeah just if i can add to that one point that you had made snack it was very interesting how dr shabir ali he wanted to point to um the old testament the shema so shema israel adonai Elohim, adonai had or yahweh Elohim, yahweh had as pointing to um tawhid but maybe shabir ali doesn't understand that the Jews themselves, when they get into philosophy and actually explain what this means, they take the Mu'tazila position, the Shia position of absolute divine simplicity as the representation of Tawheed. So Ali, uh, Dr. Shabir Ali was trying to appeal to the Jews, yet he's actually appealing to a Jewish thought paradigm that is the exact opposite than what him as a Sunni would subscribe to as being either an Ashari, Maturidi, maybe even an Athari, but it is completely contrary to the Mu'tazila position. Yeah, and this position yeah. becomes more and more um, popular. This is an outbreak of Mu'tazilites uh, online because they, they don't want to defend their chronology anymore, and uh, especially yeah. you know with the um, scripture comment, uh, commentary, with, the, with what we learn about the Quran and the fact that it's not being fully preserved and, and mm -hmm. what, what um, Mr. Ali admitted to a few days ago, uh, if, if I can trust uh, David Wood, um, which, uh, they yeah. start to, to shift towards this position, which is contrary to their own tradition. And I want to also add, and I think both Sam and David Wood make a very good case, that the Quran doesn't, at the very least explicitly say that the bible that we have is corrupt or anything like that it's kind of like a new argumentation that's not a quranic argumentation so kai's point about how it be how, how the debate is paradigmatic is more important here is is it's much more clear in that context when you understand that the quran never explicitly states that the bible is corrupt and i've seen this like i've seen this from david wood i've seen this i've seen sam make very good criticisms regarding this. So I, they're the experts on this, but I think it's a very compelling case uh, about how Muslims should actually view the Bible and the Torah and the, you know, the books. Yeah. If, if I may, because you guys are speaking about Shabir Ali and I started doing ministry to Muslims, not that I'm qualified, but I trust the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in the late nineties, I can tell you what Shabir Ali's agenda is. Now, my brothers here, you're talking about the necessity for philosophically sophisticated argumentation to show why Tawheed is philosophically and logically fallacious. The problem with Shabir Ali is that he's not philosophically trained, number one, not that I'm saying I am, but more importantly, Shabir Ali is not targeting the philosophers. He's targeting the average Christian, the average Muslim. And unfortunately, and this is a fact, many Christians don't know their respective tradition and they don't know how to exegete the Bible so Shabir is targeting the, those individuals where if you can go to the Bible, which is the common <clears throat> source of authority for all Christians across the board, be it Orthodox, Roman Catholic, varieties of Protestantism. If he can show Christians that the Bible does not teach a trinity, his, he's accomplished his goal because then it becomes, so what? What later centuries of Christians said about the trinity, the trinity is contradicted by the very source of authority that they believe is God breathed, breathed out by God. And the reason why he's quoting Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 is not so much to appeal to what the Jews believe, but as to show the discontinuity with the Old Testament and the New Testament, even though he doesn't believe the New Testament teaches the full orb doctrine of the Trinity, still the view that according to him, what you find in the New Testament is Arianism, the teaching that 
Jesus is the first creature of God. He's not fully God. He is a subordinate deity created by the Father through whom all other, all other things are created. So he wants to show a discontinuity with the Old Testament that God is one, not just one being, but in person, which is why you won't find the Trinity articulated in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, you still don't find the Trinity articulated. <clears throat> what you find is the semi-divine being, a creature, which conflicts with Deuteronomy 6.4, and so when you talk about the church father, Shabir Ali will say, that's precisely the point. It took centuries for Christians to come up with a doctrine, a doctrine that's not anchored in the sound interpretation of the Bible. So first and foremost, before we get into the philosophical arguments, we need to be trained in the biblical foundation for these doctrines and show that what the church fathers did, they didn't go against scripture. They just brought out with greater clarity what's been taught in scripture. So that is primary and crucial, especially for many Christians who are not philosophically rigorous or trained to deal with these concepts. Very so true. we need to go back to the scriptures to show no Shabir. The scriptures do lay the foundation of the Trinity. No Shabir. John 1 does not teach that Jesus is a creature of God. Arius was wrong. Paul does not teach that Jesus is created wisdom of Proverbs 8.22, because as you guys fully know, Proverbs 8.22 was a controversial text that even Arius used to show the sun was created so that there was a time in which the sun was not. These are the issues we need to engage in order to help the Christians see the biblical foundation of their faith and then train them to be philosophically rigor rigorous and sophisticated. On that note, Sam, um, so one of Shabir's uh, arguments was that even within the four Gospels, you get a, a development, you get a really, really low kind of man Christology and Mark and then you bump it up to the synoptics and then you get then you get like you know logos god in john um so w i mean jay i know jay knows all, all this and he had he could have re responded to done this exposition um but uh, you know time constraints so would you like to give us the high christology uh, of mark um are you talking to me or jay yeah you sam yeah oh yeah very easy i mean uh, if you can help me i don't know do you have a bible in front of you my brother uh Yes. Okay, if you just go to Mark chapter 1, the very start. In fact, it's ironic you mentioned this. I'm doing a series on synoptic Christology, and Jay is more than qualified to do the same if he hasn't already done so. But if you go to Mark, even Mark, the way Mark, and the reason why I start with Mark, just for people, again, I keep forgetting, not many people may be aware of what liberal critical scholarship teaches about the Gospels. According to liberal scholarship, and you have even some evangelicals who believe this, but I'm not aware about the Orthodox tradition, so please educate me. I'm your student. I want to learn about the Orthodox tradition. Scholars will tell you that Mark is the first of the Gospels written, and then Matthew and Luke use Mark as a source, and then some other source called Quella, some hypothetical fictional source. But anyway, so what does Shabir do? He says, okay, let's start with Mark. Mark is the first of the Gospels. Look, you have a Jesus that's more human less divine, if at all divine, and as you work your way to Matthew, Luke, and John, now you get Arius' Christ in the Gospel of John. You don't get the second person, the Trinity. He still does not believe that when you come to the Gospel of John, you get the second person, the Trinity. You get Arius' Christ, the first creature of God the Father. But this is why, again, it's important. Folks, it's very important. And I'm not speaking to the panel here, the distinguished panel. And, it's, I, I, and I say this with all... Sincerity. It is an honor for me to share this panel with you guys, and I'm falling in love with you guys, especially the doctrine of yeah. research in the background. You, uh, you know, I'm going to be hunting you down and picking sure. your brain. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, doctor? Hope you don't mind. But uh, it's very important for us Christians to be able to show, not just from John, but from Mark, Matthew, and Luke, that they depict Jesus as the God of the Old Testament in flesh, that he is the God that the yeah. Old Testament prophet said would come and that he is God incarnate, yet he's not the Father and he's not the Spirit. And you can do that beautifully by just looking at Mark 1. If you look at the first four verses, you just go to Mark 1, verses 1 to 4. How does Mark begin his gospel? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. Right? I know that's, yeah, we won't, we won't get into variant readings. As it is written in the prophets, and he quotes Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. If you look at it in front of you, it's Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, and Mark 1, 2. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of, ahead of you to prepare your way. But then in verse 3, he quotes Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, prepare the way for the Lord. Now, what's interesting 
about those two citations. Those two citations, if you read them in the context, it's talking about God sending an envoy to prepare for the coming, not of the creature, but the God of Israel. In Malachi 3.1, if you look at it in its context, it says, Behold, I send a messenger ahead of me to prepare my way. Suddenly, the Lord whom you seek will come to his temple. Now, the, the Hebrew words, and I know the Orthodox Church prefers the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. In the Hebrew, Malachi 3 verse 1, the, the words, the Lord is ha-adon. That phrase is never used for anyone other than the true almighty God, the God of Israel. For Yahweh, if you want to pronounce it Yahweh, Jehovah, I don't care how you pronounce it. Just again, just to let the audience know that this is a reference for the true God. It's never used for a creature. And to further reinforce that this Lord is the God of Israel, it says the Lord is coming to his temple. Anyone reading the Old Testament will know the temple was not built for man or a creature. It was built for the God of Israel. So whoever this figure is, he owns the temple. He's coming to the temple. But then it says, and the angel of the covenant whom you desire, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So an amazing figure is going to show up. This figure is the Lord. He owns a temple. He's the angel of the covenant. And those of you who are well conversant with the fathers. This identifies the Messiah as that particular angel of God who yeah. appeared in the Old Testament as God and spoke to the patriarchs like Abraham and to the prophets. In fact, Justin Martyr, in his dialogue with Trifo the Jew, appeals to the angel of God as proof of Jesus' pre-human existence as God, son of the one who's above being named. So this is an ancient tradition. In Malachi 3, he's coming. And when is he going to come? After I send the messenger to prepare for his way. And then in Isaiah 40, verse 3, it's even more explicit that this voice in the wilderness is preparing for the Lord. In Hebrew, yod Hey vav Hey, the divine name, Yahweh, Yehovah, Jehovah. And Mark says, John is that voice. John is that messenger. That means now that John has showed up, Israel, be prepared. Your God is about to show up. But who's the God who shows up? Jesus Christ. And that's in the first four verses of Mark chapter 1. Yeah, yeah well, one thing that shocked me was um, when Shabir said that there's, there's the only gospel that has I am statements is, is John. Yeah. Uh, but I was watching your stream, uh, and you, you blew my mind with this because I, 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 didn't, I didn't know this when I was reading. Yes. Um, the Mark 6 verse uh, 50 with uh, yes. Jesus passing them by, just like uh, with Isaiah, as you pointed out, and Moses. Um, and then he says, you, and he says, uh, be of good cheer, it is I, which is an I am statement. Yeah. And you who speak Greek, you see, it's ego I me. So you guys have an advantage. Orthodox Greek is your mother tongue. It's in your tongue and in your mother's tongue. So it's ego I me. Read it. It's there. Yeah. So it's a lie when Shabir says, the ego I me, the I am statements are only in John. No, Mark uses it in Mark 6, 45 to 52. And there it is a Christophany, an appearance of a divine person, because Jesus does what the Old Testament says only the true God can do. He tramples on the waves and the wind, and when they see him, they don't recognize him. So he says, do not be afraid, ego eimi. Now, what's interesting is Matthew also quotes that in Matthew 14, 22 to 33, and it's found in John 6, 16 to 21. Now, who doesn't quote it? Luke. Now, what's the point? If I follow the type of scholarship that Shabir Ali employs, that means Luke used Mark, which means Luke was aware of the I am statement, but still chose not to use it. So just because the gospel writers don't quote more of Jesus's I am statements doesn't mean they were not aware of it. They just decided not to quote those because it didn't serve the purpose in which they wrote. So you can't have your cake and eat it too, Shabir. If you're going to play that route, it ends up destroying your position. Give up on Islam. Give up on the false prophet Muhammad. Come worship Jesus as your God and Savior. Mm -hmm. Amen. That was anyone a great wanna, point. If anyone want to add anything, <clears throat> the, 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 there's I am's uh, later in Mark as well, uh, as we yep. as we noticed uh, when Jesus gives his version of the uh, all of that discourse. There, uh, there's then the, when the high priest responds, he rends his <laughs> garment. Uh, there's at least two more I am statements in Mark. One thing that I've noticed about Mark lately, I've been interested in uh, the, the uh, theophanies and like Second Temple apocalyptic literature and stuff like that. 
And the the interesting thing about Mark is the the baptism actually has elements of the Ezekiel theophany, and actually Matthew changes the wording a little bit to make it even more closely look like the Ezekiel theophany in Ezekiel 1 and 2, when he's by the river Kebar, and it says the heaven was torn open. So in Mark's, it just says heaven was opened when he was baptized. In Matthew, it actually changes the word, so it is that word that means ripped open that's the same that the Septuagint used in, in Ezekiel. So it looks like that baptism is a theophany, uh, and there's no there's no other God there, right? It's just the voice of the Father, but the but Jesus is there. And then of course the resurrection, the after the, the post resurrection appearances look kind of they have elements of a theophany. And then in the dead center, like the literal center of the Gospel of Mark is the Transfiguration, which looks like a theophany. Beautiful. So you actually have this book where it's like it begins and ends and has uh, the very center. And if you know about kind of ancient literature, a lot of times they had the chiastic pattern where you would put the most important part right at the very center. Um, so it looks like, I mean, you've got this thing as it begins and ends and has in the middle theophanies and Jesus is the only visible figure in, in the theophany. Uh, and then, you know, of course, the, the Matthew and Luke have that same thing. They just, uh, they just tack on a virgin birth narrative at the beginning, which, uh, there's some reason historically to think that in the earliest, you know, few decades or whatever of, of the church that um, there there may have been some people who wanted to say that Jesus wasn't really divine and he was just a man or whatever, but they didn't believe in the virgin birth. Um, so if you like the Ebionites who were kind of these early Jewish Christians, but they didn't think Jesus was divine, they also thought that um that Joseph was his father, right? So it certainly looks like tacking on, you know, if you believe in that developmental sort of narrative, it's, it looks like uh, Matthew and Luke are just saying like, no, we're on team divine here, you know, with the, the virgin birth. Narrative. So yeah, to me, it looks like the synoptics absolutely have Jesus being, uh, being the theophany in, in the new mm -hmm. Testament. Here. And, and, uh, speaking of Mark, there's Mark 12, 30, uh, 35, uh, where Christ quotes a psalm from David. It basically says, Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say, he's talking to a scribe in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And what's Christ's argument? He says, therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And so he's basically adopting that title, not adopting, but he's basically saying, I am that person and basically using, making that argument. So I, I, I can't, I can't really understand this like low Christology argument from Dr. Ali. It doesn't make any scriptural sense at least. I mean, I just randomly found it just in this discussion. Even if I can randomly find it just in this discussion, yeah. then surely the, like, the whole book probably has a lot of statements like this that are quite obvious, I will say. If I can just comment, because I think this will be an objection that we're going to address, because I don't know what objections you raised. He mentioned it to Jay. He goes, what you have here is subordinationism, because it's God mm -hmm. doing something for the other. And his argument was, because when the Daniel 7 passage came up, the Son of Man writing on the clouds, if you go back and listen, because this is one of his uh, trademark arguments. Well, the Son of Man is given this glory. He's given this dominion. He doesn't possess it intrinsically, and therefore, he's a subordinate deity, hence Arianism. So even in the passage you cited, because I know Shabir, he's very sly, he's very slick. I've been following him for years, so I know his tactics. He'll say, but wait, read that passage again. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Why is he being invited to sit at God's right hand if he's God by nature and equal to the Father? Why is someone else giving him all these divine honors and privileges if they're essentially equal? So that has to be addressed when you're dealing with Shibri Ali and yep. Muslims think like Sam, him. Sam, Sam, that's something and, I noticed in the debate too, is that, uh, well, among Muslims in general, is a lack of nuance and ability to make distinctions. So, um, oh, to give. Well, you can't be giver and receiver at the same time in the same way. And they'll apply this also to the Trinity. Um, 
that you can't be one in three exactly in the same way, but as you'll notice, <laughs> none of the fathers say exactly in the same way. I mean, the yeah. whole part of the, the patristic theology is to make these distinctions. Now, I think this reveals a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say malintent, but in the sense of they're trying to force it into an aporia, a problem, yeah. um, rather than trying to work through, for example, I mean, if, if I was Muslim, I would want to know how do you understand this rather than trying to immediately force it into um, a problem and say, well, look, it's a contradiction. Um, and it just makes you look bad because it's, are you incapable of make uh, of nuance or making distinctions? Um, and so it brings the conversation down uh, a level, which is unfortunate. And that's something that I've noticed. And I noticed in the debate as well, um, your thoughts. Excellent observation. Yeah. I don't want to keep hogging the conversation. So if someone wants to speak, I mean, because Shabir, like I said, I'm an expert on Shabir. I've been following him, unfortunately, yeah. since the late 90s. He's Feel free to bring up any objections you want, Sam, by the way. Uh, you don't have to stick to my my thing. So. Yeah. You know, well, even here, if Shabir is consistent, my response, because I, if he were to bring this up, my response would be twofold. Number one, you have to look at the, uh, the context in which the father is enthroning the son. The son is on earth in the form of a slave. Obviously, mm -hmm. he set aside his authority. So the father is exalting the son after the son voluntarily humbled himself to the point of dying mm -hmm. on the cross. That's number one. Number two, according to Islamic theology, Shabir, because you're trying to convince me. See, here's the thing. Shabir's trying to convince me to give up Christianity to follow Islam. Well, you have a problem because according to your Quran, and I'll just give you the verses, chapter 25, verse 2 of the Quran, chapter 25, verse 2 of the Quran, chapter 17, verse 111 of the Quran, Chapter 17, verse 111 says that Allah does not share his sovereignty with anyone, and he doesn't have a son who shares in his sovereignty. But surprise, surprise, Shabir, David, who you believe is a Muslim prophet, a thousand years before the birth of Christ, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, sees the Messiah as his exalted Lord, who's enthroned with the Father, sharing in his rule as the sovereign king of all creation. That means David cannot be a Muslim, neither is Jesus a Muslim, because here in the Bible you have God's Son reigning with the Father of all creation, something that the Muslim deity says cannot be done. It's not possible. So that means now you have a problem because now Jesus' statements and David's revelation shows mm -hmm. Islam is false, Muhammad is a false prophet, give up on the Quran. Now, the third response would be, your argument proves too much, Shabir. If Jesus receiving something from the Father shows he cannot be God, well, you just proved Allah can't be God because one of the 99 names of Allah, and this is based on the Quran, is al warith the one who receives an inheritance. Allah is the heir. And in the Quran, chapter 15, verse 23, giving you the references so people don't think I'm making it up. Chapter 15, verse 23. Chapter 19, verse 40. Chapter 19, verse 80. And chapter 21, verse 89, it says that Allah, we inherit from the inhabitants of the earth. Wait, how can Allah inherit anything if your definition of God is right? The fact that he inherits from creatures shows he can't be God. You just demoted Allah. Why are you a Muslim, Shabir? <laughs> and I also want to add, Amen. Sam. Amen. But I also want to add, uh, St. Kirill of Alexandria agrees with you 100%, Sam, that. Christ basically assumed that he will, uh, Father McGuckin in his book points out that he, the way he explains it, that Christ assumes limitations, but these are non-absolute limitations, meaning that he wasn't absolutely limited. He didn't lose his omniscience while he limited himself, but he still nevertheless assumed a real limitation that didn't inhibit his divinity. So yeah, like excellent point. And I also want to add that Dr. Shabir's argumentation and the way he looks at terms is very reminiscent of eunomius it's kind of like this linguistic univocalism where distinct terminologies indicate distinct essences yeah. so if the lord is if the lord is being received something yes. well the, our understanding of god is that he gives something he cannot receive anything that's basically the argument and so if 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 christ receives something then he cannot be god that's kind of like the Exactly. intrinsic yeah. argument that's that's me and this is exactly the same methodology eunomius uses who as we all know lived before islam even existed so this is 
this predates Islam, this kind of argumentative stuff. So it's not even new. It's pretty old. Right. Well, well I'm very to, skeptical. Yeah, go ahead, Jay. Uh, Mark, it was Mark 12, 27, and then Mark 14, 62 that I wanted to add. And the, the imagery there is hearkening to, um, well, when Jesus talks about the Son of Man coming in the clouds, when he's given the Olivet Discourse in Mark, um, this is reminiscent not just of Daniel 7, but also the many times in the, in the Psalms that God is said to ride the clouds. It's like a chariot. This is the Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10 imagery. Uh, Psalm, I think it's 105, I think, where he talks about the Lord rides the chariot. He rides the clouds, the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Yeah. Psalm 104 in Hebrew, but I think it's Psalm 103 in the Greek, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, one chapter off. But uh, point being is that I think, and also is it Jeremiah 413, I think, where it mentions the the Lord will come in on the clouds. Anyway, Jesus is saying, basically, he's identifying himself as the one like a son of man in the Old Testament who comes on the clouds. Now, I, I read Daniel 7 as the ascension. I think that's Christ ascending 100%. with the cloud of witnesses to receive from the Father uh, in the human nature, as Sam pointed out, the dominion, the power, the glory, the, the, in the human nature, right? The right to rule the nations, which the apocalypse says upon the ascension when he was caught up into God's throne. To God's throne in Apocalypse 12, did he receive the right to rule all the nations? That's in his human nature. So, in other words, all those statements in, in the, the synoptics that if you understand the, the rest of the theology and the Old Testament imagery, those are all statements of divinity too. That's why they were making the Jews so mad when he would say these things. They would be like, you know, rending their garments. Oh, I have a question, Jay and Sam. Um, one thing I was thinking about in the debate was... Um, the Hebrews passage, and then is it Corinthians? I, I'm trying to remember that. Uh, Do you remember the point, argument? Or Christ is the exact iconos Wait. image. Hebrews oh, one three. Hypostasis, yeah. Yeah. Hebrews chapter Hebrew. one verse three. The character. Yeah. And then it's it's is it expressed again? There's one other fifteen. Colossians. The yeah. image, the icon of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, and second second Corinthians four verse four. Second so, four verse four, Colossians one fifteen, Hebrews one three. I was curious; those verses were on my mind um, during the debate, and I was curious how somebody like uh, uh, the doctor uh, Shabir would actually respond to that, or other Muslims. What's your experience when you bring that up? Yeah. Do you want me to answer that first, or? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Sam. Well, it's because Shabir, remember, I Shabir is very sly, and he studied. He has gotten drunk from the pool of liberal scholarship. He'll say, yes, he's the image of God, but he's not God any more than Adam, who's the image of God, is God. Because in 1 Corinthians, 11, verse that, yeah. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7, it specifically says that man is the image and glory of God. And he'll say, well, no Christian would say that man, finite, temporal, is God, fully God in essence, or God incarnate. So this language would actually imply that Jesus isn't God, but he's the human representative of God, and that's what Islam teaches. So that's what he would say. But I think Hebrews 1.3 is even more powerful in its language. And you, you, again, Father, you know Greek better than I do, but from my understanding, the word is character. Character in the Greek is actually the exact imprint, the exact, 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 exact God's that's what... substance. A creature cannot be. Again, That's again, where the Hebrews is better. That's I much better. Mm -hmm. Because there's no way a finite creature can be the exact copy of God's infinite, uncreated substance. Impossible, unless yeah. he too is truly God. So that Hebrews 1.3, he can't tap dance around. But guess what his argument will be? We don't know who wrote Hebrews, and the early church had a debate hmm. regarding its canonicity. You see liberal scholarship again. That's, that passage is one of St. Athanasius' main arguments in his discourse against the Arians. It's calling the son the exact image of the father and he uses a bunch of analogies to do that yeah. um but yeah um uh, do you have anything to comment on this kai um uh, regards how how this critique might perhaps backfire on islam not so much with regards to the verses you guys are way more well versed in how to argue that i'm my specialty is more of like him from the Islamic perspective and in terms of the argumentation that he would use. Um, if I was to actually 
kind of comment on any of this stuff. It is going to be peripheral, but it's really more along what David had said with regards to terminology and the way he's understanding and using certain terminology. And I was kind of saving that for the more proper part of the debate and that when we talk talk about the part where he was talking about spirits and this whole yeah. historian idea. L- let's, move, let's move on to that. Let's move on to this, the, the, the questioning where it was kind of um, because I expected when Shabir to do the crossfire that he would just hammer on scriptural arguments for all 20 minutes. But lo and behold, he spent mm-hmm. his whole 20 minutes doing philosophical or like theology proper argumentation. I was, I didn't know why I was a little shocked. Um, but what was odd was that he was trying to get Jay to equivocate on the word spirit. Um, and, and you found something from Maturidi, which uh, is interesting to do with Shabir. And because yeah. I, I have an inkling that Maturidi <coughs> is Shabir's teacher, because I know that Ijaz told me his teacher was, uh, his theology is Maturidi. And he said Shabir is his teacher. So, yeah. Yeah. So whether, whether or not Shabir. Dr. Shabir Ali subscribes to like the Maturidi school of Kalam or Aqida or Ashari. Like there are differences. They're not too great in terms of their differences, but he, mostly like if you're going to read about Ashari, you're going to read about Maturidi and vice versa. You're going to know both of them. And he used a line of argumentation and terminology that got me thinking how he refused to go into this aspect with Jay, but yet he didn't shy away from using basically the substance of the argumentation or the presentation of what Maturidi does in the Kalam, in the Kitab al-Tawheed. And there is a extract that I would like to read to you from Maturidi's own writing. So now you have to remember, this is going back to like the 9th, 10th centuries. And so what Maturidi is writing in the Arabic, he says, So what he's saying here is, is that there is a not sort of like a disagreement or there's different camps of Christians with different views of Christ, of the Messiah, Al-Masih. And from one of them, you have a camp that creates or designates to Christ two spirits, two spirits, not four, two, Ruhain. Ja'ala lahu Ruhain. And they're saying that the earthly spirit, Ruh Anasutia, resembles arwah nas the spirits of mankind so basically it's a soul so that earthly spirit is the soul that is shared among every single human being but then the divine spirit um is eternal it's a part from allah jizmin allah that is fil badan dalik in that body And so he was, from this language, Maturidi is essentially equating that you have a human soul, Ruh, and a divine soul, Ruh. And this is where he's getting this notion that God has some kind of soul, and that this soul is what is in Christ, becomes part of Christ, or descends in Christ, whatever the mechanism is, comes to reside in Christ. And he's trying to understand this, and it's very Nestorian in that he's trying to put in two separate components into Christ as distinct entities, because in that in the Arabic, the ruh is something that is self-subsistent. It's not the way we understand nature to be, because we have in orthodoxy the nature of person distinction so you can have one person it's that a has, hypostasis yeah the hypo the hypostasis or the prosopon the one hypostasis one prosopon that then has the two natures the two um uh, usia or the two feces so we can have that in our theology but you see in the arabic the way that maturidi is using aruch he's 
talking about something that is self-subsistent. And this is the line of questioning that um, that Dr. Shabir Ali was trying to engage Jay in, is how you have the coming together of these two self-subsistent entities where and he's misunderstanding exactly what the nature the divine nature is he's attributing it to as something a ruh as something that is part of Allah and so that kind of got me strange this is like he doesn't want to go into that but he's using literally exactly the argumentation as appearing in the Maturidi school of thought let me just comment why he does that it's Shabir is not comfortable debating Islamic topics He's more comfortable going on the attack. That's why if you pay attention, go through his history of debates, if you ever challenge him to debate an Islamic topic, he insists there'll be two topics in one, Islamic and Christian topic rolled up in one debate, or he'll agree to debate you just on an exclusively Christian topic. But if you're to challenge him, let's just do Tawheed and Islam, he'll say no, Tawheed and Trinity. He does not like to be put on the defensive and just have to answer objections to his position he likes to go on the offensive and corner Christians. That's why when Jay was asking them those questions that his tradition could not answer, well, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not qualified, but then he ended up assaulting our belief in the Trinity with philosophical arguments. So that's how Shabir rolls. So for future reference, anyone wanting to debate Shabir, don't play his game. That's right. You're going to have to insist. If you're going to talk about Trinity, we're going to do a topic on Tawheed, not two in one. No, no. One topic, the Trinity. One topic, Tawheed. If you don't agree to Tawheed, no debating the Trinity. I'm sorry, Shabir. I'm not here to serve you and to advance your agenda. So beware of his tactics. Like Paul said, we're not unaware of the schemes of Satan. So yeah, mm. well, that, that's why I'm sorry. Gonna... Yeah, go ahead, Kai. Yeah. Well, I was going to say is because I remember in one of his statements, like Dr. Shabir Ali, just before he brought up the point where he doesn't want to discuss it, he's like, and I've proved my point um, scripturally, whatever, and logically. And then literally like a couple minutes later, he's like, no, I don't want to get into logic because that's not my, like, that's not yeah. my expertise. Not my forte. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's advice for all other budding apologists. Do not, do not agree to Shabir's terms, always put him on the defensive as you defend your position. And don't do two topics in one. Like if we challenge him, let's debate is the Quran the word of God? No, Quran and the Bible. Say, no, no. Is the Quran the word of God? One topic. And then we'll do another topic is the Bible the word of God. Is mm. Tawheed rational? Is it logically consistent? And then we can do it not two in one because mm. he won't agree to that. Yeah. But he'll agree to do a topic just on Christianity so he can go on the attack. Look, yeah. he had no problem debating Jay on, is Jesus God? Yeah. But challenge him to do something. That, that's, what, that, that's what was potent about Jay's paradigm critique, though, um, and, and what people didn't really understand because it was like, oh, but but Jay's going on the attack. How can he do this? This isn't allowed, <laughs> you know? Um, but, but the point is that we're in this debate, Jay was comparing two systems mm-hmm. is Jesus God? Which one justifies mm-hmm. the, the, the position well? And which is more coherent? And whichever is more coherent is obviously going to be the, the correct paradigm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, what, that's what surprised Shabir, because Shabir believed that he would be uh, um, on the offensive and Jay managed to, to go on the offensive and attack him. And, and he was very destabilized. And um, about the um, half of the debate, he, he clearly gives up and he just starts to probe Christian yeah. theology. Just tries to, oh, you know, these two natures doesn't make much sense. He goes into theopashism. Um, so yeah, uh, he clearly he clearly gave up at some point. Um, we we, we clearly as, saw it. as as soon as Jay said they are energies of God, he gave uh, up and, the debate. Energies, the that was it. What, 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 what energies? Uh, energies? What, what? <laughs> that was it. Then he was on autopilot for the rest of the debate, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was. Like the critique I gave about linguistic univocalism was also there. Like he kind of taught like, well, if there are seven spirits, spirits, how can there be a Holy Spirit? Then does that yeah. mean that seven spirits are like seven Holy Spirits or are there seven gods? And that was kind of strange. And like, and Jay's response that I think Mr. Uh, Dr. Lee missed is, yeah. uh, is about this, the spirit. The word spirit can have multiple senses, right? It doesn't only have one sense. So in some sense, it can mean incorporeality. It can mean soul it can mean all of these different things but i want to ask kai because he had 
he talked about ruh and he talked about spirit and all that stuff. So is that does that mean like the self-subsistent ruhs, right, Kai? Am I getting you right? Yeah. Yeah. Is ruh human soul or is that something else, for example, in the case of a human being? Well, in, in the most general context, it's just spiritual. It doesn't necessarily have to mean more than that. It can have multiple meanings. Okay. So when you say the ruh of a person or the ruh in terms of like a divine service, it, it can just mean the, something that is spiritual, that yeah. is not corporeal, essentially. So is not- the human person identical with the ruh, with the human ruh, or are they two different things? No, they, they would be two different things because in mm-hmm. Islam, you have this notion of the soul that pre-exists the body. Yes. And so mm-hmm. in that sense, Ruh does contain within it this self-subsistence. Yeah. And so when yes. he's talking about in Christ, there are two uh, Ruhain. So he's mm-hmm. talking about the human Ruh, which it is shared in common with all of humanity. Mm-hmm. It is basically a pre-existing ruh that Christ would have in that exact same mm-hmm. sense. But then also he's talking about in the sense of we're thinking like when we're talking about, let's say, the Holy Spirit or God's existence, that there is this also spiritual soul, but that it is self-subsistent. Yeah. So it's yep. saying that this divine Mm-hmm. Entity is eternal, and he's he's specifically saying jizm in Allah. It's a part of Allah, so that it's not so much that it's Allah itself Himself that is coming into the body of Christ, but it is this self-subsistent divine spirit that from Allah yeah. that comes to reside in Christ. My but questions I- are more relating to the human paradigm. So what what I was kind of getting at is there is that if there's a human person there's, that's self-subsistent, and then there's the ruh, the human ruh that's self-subsistent doesn't that all kind of indicate that there's like two different subjects at work and it's and a muslim might say well they're united maybe they, they might say but then it kind of seems like they're working in conjunction it seems like they just like have the same will and they do the same things they work in conjunction but they're still two distinct subjects and so that's kind of like a weird anthropology in mm-hmm. in islam it seems like i, I think this is like what occasionalism was... in philosophy yeah. right to... this, yeah. this is what I, I think was confusing jay was because for for us, the you know Christ's humanity with all the faculties and the soul and everything, is not is not self subsistent. It subsists in the hypostasis of Christ. Yes. Right. So so it, it doesn't it it doesn't map it doesn't map mm-hmm. one to one. So the the critique it was just a kind of a strange. I I think Jay found it kind of strange. <laughs> I certainly yeah. found it strange. Yeah, I didn't know where he was going with that. I was yeah. I just thought he was equivocating over the usage of words. I didn't know where he was going with that either. Yeah, mm-hmm. and this, this is where kind of like yeah. I also found it strange is that what Shabir's like he's taking these Islamic notions from Maturidi, but he's not listening to Jay. He's not integrating what Jay is telling him about our Christology. And you can clearly see in the cross examination, Jay is very clear making the nature person distinction. But then you have Shabir Ali's, Dr. Shabir Ali's closing remarks. It was a script, literally was zero a script. integration. It was the same script as the just read a script. Yeah, yeah. That might be and, a good point, by the way, is that uh, in future debates, beginning the debate by saying these terms: person, nature, thing, being. Um, we're not going to understand them in the same way. Mm-hmm. The way that you approach the Quran is not how we approach the Bible. Um, just to set off the, the debate that, look, we're coming from, as Kai pointed out, different paradigms, because they just assume this going into the debate, yeah. and this is why they bring in all this higher textual criticism. They think that, uh, you know, and I, I've spoken uh, to all of you about this before, they think that, oh, we derive our tradition from the text as if we found this text, like it's an archaeological dig. We go, hey, look what we found. How can we, uh, what are these people saying um, in this idea that there are all the apostles are just different kind of competing disciples with their own kind of theories. And we've just got to apply, like any other text, this kind of textual criticism and try to figure out what they're saying. 
I think it would be helpful to point out that, in fact, that no, we don't derive our theology and tradition from the text of the scripture, but the tradition in the text of the scripture is one whole. It comes, even the scriptures themselves and how they're canonized, how we read them, is part of the tradition and a living tradition of the community that hasn't, so they don't have this notion at all. I'm kind of curious if we bring this up in this way, where we kind of lay out that we're approaching this, the meaning of words, the paradigm, the text itself in a fundamentally different way. Well, you notice- How do you think yeah, they would respond to that? You notice yeah. when, when he made his uh, ad hoc argument about some texts are clear and others are not, that he's coming at it from a paradigm of yeah. what we will call you know classical foundationalism that you just look at the text and you just look up a word and that tells you the meaning but of course as we've seen in the course of this conversation words and texts are nuanced and they're part of a lexicon they're part of a web they're part of a network of corresponding words uh, and so that older notion that's pretty consonant with aristotelianism and i think you know for most of what we know of, of what i know of islam the only philosophical school that really jives well with them is Aristotelianism. So there's just kind of this sort of naive approach to text, a naive empirical approach to understanding words and meaning to where you, well, you just look at what the text says and then you go look at a dictionary and you define it. That's what it means, right? But we know that we know that it's a lot more nuanced than that. And philosophy, of course, shows us that we right. all interpret words, texts, anything like that from within our paradigm. And that's why, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, Father Deacon, you can't just... You can't just look at a word and just and oh well it's a br brute factually I know you know what this word means it's 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 not like that words don't work. By the way, guys, is my microphone low or bad? It's it's working now. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I, I wanted to yeah. say something about when you say that it's uh, Shabir Ali's approach or Muslim approach is text based. Not necessarily. Number one, right, right, right. They're in, yeah. he's inconsistent, isn't he? he well, plays not only consistent. They don't. They're not. Quran only. They don't have a sola scriptura. The Sunnis are Quran and tradition. Sunni right. Muslims go by Quran and tradition. But beyond that point, as far as Shabir Ali is concerned, you guys are giving him too much credit to think that he's this philosophically trained and he understands these issues. He's not on that level. If you were talking about Hamza Yusuf, I'd say yes. Yeah, you can talk in these categories when it comes to Hamza Yusuf because he is trained, philosophically trained and very well read. Now, but as far as the distinction between spirit and soul, this arises from later tradition. It's not Quranically based. For example, mm. and if the Muslims are listening to me, they can easily refute me. In the Quran, you will never find the word ruh used in reference to man. It's always used in reference to God. The only one to be mm. said to be said to be a spirit from God is Jesus. In chapter 4, verse 171 of the Quran, Surat Al-Nita, chapter 4, verse 171. In rebuking Christians for exaggerating mm. and going beyond the limits, the Quran rebukes Christians saying, <clears throat> when you talk about Jesus, say that he is the Messiah, the son of Mary, the apostle of Allah, a, his word, karimatuhu, right? his word, which he cast down to Mary, al-qaha illa maryam, ruh al-min, ruh, the word ruh is there. The only person besides Allah to have identified as a spirit or having a spirit is Jesus. In the Quran, all throughout the Quran, human beings are said to have nafs, soul, mm -hmm. but you will not find and here's my challenge. Prove me wrong. You'll not find a single verse in the Quran where man is said to have a spirit or is a spirit. Ruh. Man is said to be a soul or is a soul. Nafs. And ironically, even Allah himself has a nafs. He has a spirit and he has a nafs, a spirit and a soul. And that's articulated in Surah Al-Maida, chapter 5, verse 116, where Jesus says, you know what is in my soul, but I do not know what's in your soul, your nefs. Mm -hmm. So even the distinction between spirit and being self-subsisting, -subsist, uh, that's not Quranic. That's mm -hmm. later logical and philosophical speculation due to the interaction with various groups, Christian philosophers, Jewish philosophers, mm -hmm. also influenced by Greek philosophical thinking, Aristotelian mm -hmm. categories, but that's not from the Quranic text. So I just want to be clear. I don't want people to think that yeah. when Maturiti speaks about the spirit being self-subsisting, he's not getting it from the text. The text mm -hmm. does not say anything about the spirit being yep. self-subsisting. Uh, uh, Sorry, my list. <laughs> 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 okay, 
That's later. You're good, you're good. Philosophical you're speculation. I was yeah. hoping we would. Um, I mean, a few more comments, but. Uh, one thing I, I, I find interesting, and Sam, maybe you can help me out here, is that it's, it seems to me like, on the one hand, Muslim apologists, they, they have to appeal to the higher criticism. Like, they have to. Yeah. But on the other hand, yeah. it's almost like their tradition forbids them from doing that. Because mm-hmm. they still, because, I mean, even, even lots of their scholars, they didn't believe in a full-on, like, textual, you know, corruption of, 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 of the biblical text, did they? No. See, it, this is the dilemma the Quran puts Muslims in. And someone, once someone was mentioning that they've been listening to David Wood and I, we call this the Islamic dilemma. Repeatedly throughout the Quran from beginning to end, Muhammad is commanded by the spirit that inspired him. It's not the true God, obviously. To say to the Jews and Christians, I confirm, my Quran confirms the scriptures you possess right now that you have access to that you're reading. And one of the proofs of his prophethood, one of the proofs of his prophethood in the Quran is, I agree with your scriptures. I confirm your scriptures. My book Mm -hmm. confirms what you have. But then when you examine what the Quran says, it does anything but agree with the contents of those scriptures in the possession of the Jews and Christians. Mm -hmm. But you will not find anywhere in the Quran where Muhammad says, only parts of your scriptures are valid, and there are parts (laughs) that have been tampered with or added to no, from A to Z, from beginning to end, Muhammad says, I confirm what you have between your hands. I confirm the Torah that you have right now. I confirm the gospel that you have right now. In fact, not only do I confirm your scriptures, the ones you're reading right now, they also prophesy my advent. So now the Muslim is in a dilemma. Muhammad is not a liar. He's not a false prophet. And he says that the scriptures of the Jews and Christians are the uncorrupt words of God. Yep. But the only scriptures they have are the books of the Bible. And the Quran does anything but agree with the books of the Bible. That means you guys must have corrupted your scriptures. See, they can't then take it to its conclusion and say, well, then Muhammad is a fraud. Because Muhammad is telling us those scriptures are the pure, uncorrupt revelations. In fact, Jews and Christians are commanded to use them to judge even Muhammad. It's yes. in chapter 5 of the Quran. Again, I'm not making it up. Chapter 5, Surah al Maida, verses 45 all the way to 48. Chapter 10, Surah Al-Yunus, verse 94, and I can give you many passages. So now if you're a Muslim and you believe Muhammad is a prophet, what are you going to then assume? The scriptures must be corrupt because Muhammad is not a liar. No, this is proof of the fraud of Muhammad. Give up on Muhammad and do as he said. Confirm our scriptures, embrace their teaching, abandon Muhammad, and come worship Jesus as your Lord, God, and Savior. Mm -hmm. is, Is there any way that they, like, interpret that? in any fancy way i mean is the is the idea that muhammad was saying like right when he was making that prophecy that the text as it was right then was good their their explanation is he's not confirming the scriptures wholesale he's simply saying that those scriptures contain prophecies about me so now when you come to me i will then tell you which parts of those scriptures remain intact which parts have been corrupted that's how they spin it that's how they interpret it but that's mm-hmm. uh, that's not the plain reading of the passages i mean i mean if we can we can go through do an entire session just on that alone i mean there's verse after verse just in chapter two of the Quran alone, just in chapter two of the Quran alone. let me give you the verses chapter two verses 40 to 44 count how many there are chapter two of the Quran, verses 40 to 44 chapter two verse 89 chapter two verse 91 chapter two verse 97 chapter two verse 101 Chapter 2, verse 136. <laughs> chapter 2, verse 285. And that's just one chapter of the Quran. Wow. Now, if I go to the other chapters, it's going to get pretty hard for a Muslim to try to convince me that all these passages are saying is Muhammad confirms the prophecies made about him. And once you believe in him, then he'll tell you which parts of your Bible remain pure and which parts have been corrupted. That's not yeah. the message. Yeah, it's ad hoc. I mean, and, and i am only, only got 10 books into the Quran, the first 10, and... I noticed, and I, I took notes, uh, you know, I've got dozens of them. I only listed some of them in the debate. Of all these things that are being affirmed in the Christians, the Bible. Yeah. And then then you notice how ad hoc it is to turn around. Oh, well, every everything I don't like is corrupted. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the whole that's the whole thing res, resorted to that. Interesting. Project, can you let um, Lewis back in? I think his Zoom crashed. He's trying to yeah. join back. Oh, I, I kicked him out. He was misbehaving. 
<laughs> by the way, <laughs> uh, yeah. on, on a related note, here's what's ironic about Shabir's objection. He says that John's gospel is later more theolog theologically developed and less reliable. But here's what's ironic. The Quran confirms John's Logos Christology. Yep. The very gospel that, John, that Shabir said is the least reliable historically and the more theologically developed. Three times in the Quran, Jesus is said to be the word of Allah. Three times in the Quran. And Islamic tradition, you know what the names of Jesus are in Islamic tradition? Kalimat Allah, Ruh Allah. Yeah. The word of Allah, the spirit of Allah. Yeah. Now, if, yeah. now, here's the dilemma for Shabir. If John is least reliable because he's later more theologically developed, why is your Quran confirming John's Logos Christology? That's a great argument. Is wrong, then you just buried the Quran, Shabir. So why are you still a Muslim, my friend? Sam, yep. let, let me let me play, if you will, uh, the devil's advocate for a moment. Please. So how how would you be a handsome devil, by the way? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, how would you respond, for example, to the Muslim argument that Kalimatullah, the word of Allah, predicated of Jesus of Christ is simply because of Allah's speech. So Allah says to Christ, "Be." in the womb and he is yes. and that is why he is called kalimatullah you know you're 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 throwing me a curveball right i mean you're making it easy for me to respond to that nonsense very no, no, simple please, please. Yeah. yeah okay yeah. here's the argument I, I i hope they understood what you're saying the objection is jesus is not the word of god he's created by the word of god and as a result that's why he's called the word of god because god created him by his command well, if that's true, in chapter 3, verse 59 of the Quran, does it not say that Allah created Adam by his word? Mm -hmm. So where is Adam called the word of God? Yeah. Number two, doesn't the Quran say that Allah willed all existence by his command? So that that's right. means everything and everyone is the word of God. So why doesn't the Quran call anyone else besides Jesus the word of God? Yeah. But it's singling out Christ as the word of God, just yes. as Christians single yeah. him out as the word of God. Exactly. And that adds to the other point, chapter 4, verse 171. Chapter 4, verse 170 of the Quran says that Jesus wasn't brought into being by the word. He's the word. And you know the Arabic. You got, it's it's karimatuhu al-qaha illa maryam. His word, which he cast down to Mary. Assumption, Jesus was there as God's word, who then came down to his blessed mother to become yeah. flesh. Mm -hmm. That's why then it goes on to say, a spirit from him. Now notice the Quran gets it right. Because when Jesus came from the Father, he would not have been material. He would be spirit. And that's what it says. He came as spirit, mm -hmm. entered Mary, became flesh. And to further prove that the Quran is aping John's Logos Christology without the author intending to do so, to further prove it. If Jesus comes from God, then I would expect he'll return to God. In the Quran, since mankind's from the dust, they return to the dust. And yet Jesus went back to Allah, according to the Quran. In chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran, and chapter 4, verse 158, it says, Allah took Jesus to himself. So notice, he comes from Allah, and he goes to Allah. He doesn't return to the dust, because he's not from the dust. He's from Allah, according to the Quran. What's most interesting about that is that there were Christians. This is according to the Muslim sources. Ibn Kathir, Al-Tabari, Qurtubi. And you know, you're familiar with these individuals. Yeah. They will tell you that the first 80 verses of chapter third, chapter 3, if you read chapter 3, verses 1 to 84, they say those verses were revealed to respond to the objections by the Najrani Christians, the Arabic Christians, the Arab Christians from Najrani. Now, why is that interesting? Because according to the, the commentators, these verses, the first 84 verses, were revealed to respond to them. In one of those verses, you'll find chapter 3, verse 7, where Muhammad says that in the Quran, you find two sets of passages. The clear passages, they are the mother of the book, and the unclear, ambiguous ones. And those verses, no one knows what they mean except Allah. Only Allah knows what they mean. But those who have a disease in their heart focus on those verses, verses in order to cause <clears throat> division. According to the commentators... This is a, you'll find this in Ibn Kathir, it even Al Tabari. They, they say that verse was composed to stop the Christians from quoting the Quran, where it says Jesus is the Word of God and Spirit of God to prove his divinity, because no one knows what they mean except Allah. So stop using that. <laughs> I have a question, Sam. I got a question. I got a question. Let me just put this on the icing of the cake. You know what that means? That means 
A Muslim can't tell you what those verses mean because yeah. according to chapter 3, verse 7, only Allah knows what they mean. So how dare you explain them to me? I have a question, Sam. Quran study with Allah. What, Hope that answers your question. What about the, this notion of the eternal? What about this notion of the eternal Quran? I, I tried yes. to press him on that, but that, and he didn't want to go there. Could you comment on that? What, oh, yeah, what, yeah. Is that part of this same area? Well, here's the thing. He's a Sunni Muslim, but the problem with Shibra Ali, he's become so rad radicalized by liberal scholarship. He's now making concessions that now raising the eye rate of Sunni Muslims. There are now Sunni Muslims who don't like him because he is making too many concessions and he's questioning you know, Islam, Sunni Islam, sacred cow. He'll tell you, like, for example, the most authentic collection of narrations that Sunni Muslims swear by, second only to the Quran, is Sayyid Bukhari. Mm -hmm. Sayyid Bukhari. He's now willing to question that collection because of those embarrassing and humiliating yep. statements attributed to Muhammad. That now raises the irate of Sunni Muslims. And you have Sunni Muslims like Adnan Rashid, who's another apologist, not very well versed, not philosophically sophisticated who came out in a debate saying that Shira Ali does not represent us anymore because they're getting upset by the things he's saying about their sacred Sunni tradition. It is part of the aqidah of Sunni Islam. And my brother can confirm this. Ashari believed this. Maturidi believed this. Ahmed Ibn They believe the Quran is kalam Allah. Being the kalam, it's uncreated because it's one of the attributes of Allah. Now, the book is not eternal obviously so irony of ironies their view of the Quran is our view of jesus the eternal yeah, word like that became flesh the book. Mm -hmm. but here the eternal became book but shabri ali understands that if he comes out and agrees with it he's now going to put himself in a situation where now he's going to sound like a christian and yeah. trying to make sense how something can be eternal and temporal at the same time right yeah so he's so shying away argument. from that rhetoric it presupposes the incarnational principle is what he yeah. said. And, and, ah, you got it. And, and at the same time, he himself said, how can Jesus be God and man? Exactly. Man is finite. God is infinite. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. yet the same thing. Um, and, I, and I also want to actually kind of like get to that, like just a short note on that. Um, that's one of the more, more popular Muslim arguments. How can God be limited and unlimited? And if, if you look at like Jay used the example of mathematics, we can also use the example of nature. How can fire burn on water? It seems to be impossible, but there have been instances. Greek fire is one of them where uh, fire, fire burns on water. You have two sets of contradictory properties in one reality, so to speak. And we will also say that the, 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 the argument presupposes the confusion, not only of nature and person, but also the properties with person. So for example, uh, we will say the properties is something proper to the what, uh, to the natures. And the person manifests those properties. He's not identical to the properties. He's not identical to the property of being immutable, but rather he manifests immutability in his personhood. And it's the ex ex explanation of the Christologists in the 6th century, again, before Islam even existed. So many of these questions, notice, many of the questions Muslims ask, they were already answered before Islam even existed. And that's, what's the funniest, that's the funniest part for me, is that these were answered way before. I also want to add, it's not related to the topic, but Dr. Ali argued that the Jews never had this kind of Trinitarian-sounding theology or any of that sort. That's patently false. You had Jewish binitarianism, also known as Two Powers Theology. Alan Siegel makes note of this as a review of it um I, I don't remember it now but there's also arguments that it wasn't even a heresy it was actually an opinion that you yeah. could hold in judaism and judaism wasn't there wasn't any strict orthodoxy in judaism at the time so you actually had binitarianism in judaism that was a post that was a viable option and i bet they use the same passages that we're using to prove that christ is the word of god follow is a, is a yeah. jewish binitarian so there are virtues that actually needed to adopt this multiplicity scheme in God, because I will say a few of them realized how can we how can we even have unity if we can't contrast it to multiplicity in the first place? How can we even have that? It's like saying 
Well, there's a number one, but we don't need the other numbers to have the number one. Now, wait a second. If you don't need the other numbers, how can you have 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 to come to the number one? To have number one, you will have to need other numbers as well. So even apply to numbers, it's an analogy. It doesn't apply one to one, obviously, but the, as a principle, it explains our objections. You can't even have Tevhid if you can't contrast it with something else. If you don't have multiplicity, you don't have unity. If you don't have unity, you don't have multiplicity. That's how the Christian Trinitarian doctrine makes the most sense. You have both the unity of the person of the Father, but also the plurality of the persons in the triad. So that's kind of what I wanted to add. There's, there's also the other level uh, in in that that uh, that Jay brought up in the debate is the the absolute transcendence of Allah. So how can you even if if all if all the oneness that you know about in the world that you experience is sort of created instances of oneness, then how can you say there's a likeness between the the oneness of Allah and the oneness in creation? Right. If yeah. So how can you even say Allah is one if you have an absolute Mm -hmm. divide no analogia whatsoever right he further contradicts himself because if you understand the underlying assumption of his argument is if you have one being you have to have one person and therefore if you say god is more than one person he has to be more than one being and he, you ask him how do you know that because of created things so now for your argument to work you have to compare the existence yep. of allah to a finite temporal created thing yep. in order for the argument to make sense but i thought i, I thought the chronic Text says Allah is incomparable. There's nothing that can be likened to him. But for your argument to work, you have to liken him to something temporal and finite yep. for that argument to be true, Shabir. So you can't have your mm -hmm. cake and eat it too. I that, that's what he did. That's what he did. Because yeah. uh, when Jay was questioning about the Quran, he was like, "Oh well, you know, my thoughts when I write a book and stuff like that." Right there. But it, but even but even like Those I think, <laughs> and, and you can exactly, and you can correct me on this, Kai uh, and Sam, or anyone. But um, in terms of the uh, the Quran, it's it's not just the thoughts of Allah. Like, isn't the traditional way would be to yeah. say that you have the eternal speech of Allah and yeah, the Quran was half, it yeah. reflects that. But he was just another. saying, oh, well, there's just these, you know, they're just the thoughts of God as, as, <laughs> as if, you know, tr not really communicating any kind of real substance of, 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 of what you mean. What do you mean by that? What, what, do, what do you mean by that? Yeah, see, that's another thing that upset me through the debate because Shabir repeated the same points that I've been hearing for years. And he confused the ilm, the knowledge of Allah, with kalam. They're not mm -hmm. the same. He kept saying that, yes, yes, the Quran, the knowledge of Allah is in his mind. No, that's not what the Muslim scholars said. They didn't say the Quran is ilm, the knowledge of Allah. They said it's the kalam, the word of Allah. The two are not the same. Yes, the Quran is the revelation of his knowledge, but it's not identical to his knowledge. But in order for him to get away with saying that the Quran somehow is eternal, and how can he have the Quran be eternal he had to argue well the quran is simply the knowledge of god within his mind yeah. ideal pre-existence not actual pre-existence so he collapsed the two thinking he could get away with it. and that's why i got up well, like i said that's why i rejoiced that jay dyer schooled this man because i've been waiting for yeah. someone to school him <laughs> you made my day man i celebrate <laughs> with, with deep dish pizza and i'm on a diet so i broke my diet <laughs> I have a question, if I may ask, just kind of shift gears before I forget. There was at one point, Shabir Ali, Dr. Shabir Ali was trying to say, like, well, why doesn't the sun have a sun? Why doesn't the Holy Spirit have a sun? And I think this ties in very heavily to Dr. Branson's opening monologue with regards to the monarchy of the father yeah. as the, yeah. the principal cause so if, dr branson if you could kind of maybe speak to that a little bit yeah yeah that i mean that actually is one of saint photius's arguments against the filioque he says mm -hmm. like if this property of being able to generate a divine person is shareable then the father is going to share that with the son and the son's going to have there's going to be a grandson of god and a great grandson you're going to get right. this infinite series yeah. but it's that's not the the father can generate a divine person and that is his hypostatic property and so mm -hmm. you've got you can only have one god and you can only have one son of god um and the cappadocians um you know gregory nazianzen's response to the where the holy spirit comes from is it is not that you know the son has a grandson of god and so on but it's just that there's two different ways of generating a divine person uh, but but that's mm -hmm. just the father's prerogative that's his hypostatic yep. property mm -hmm. and so it's not shareable so there's no 
there's no question why can't the son or why doesn't the son generate a divine person if he did he'd just be the father yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. So like for me for me i was seeing again this was just yet another example where there is a confusion between yeah nature and person because then yeah. He's, he's yeah he's collapsing the two into one because in this case he was trying to treat causality or soul principle as a property of nature or the divine essence that is shared by all three persons of the holy trinity when in fact it is the soul cause is the property of the father and the father alone yeah exactly. which is how some western theologians tried to argue for the filioque in the middle ages they'd say like well yeah. that's just you know or the divine nature, and then, then the Greeks would respond like, "Well, then there's like infinitely many divine persons. Exactly, like, yeah. It has to be the Father's hypostatic property." Yeah. yeah and another thing about the monarchia, which I think is one of the most common, just quick shotgun citation from the Bible that the Muslims use, is that the John seventeen three, yeah. that they may know you, the only true God, the Father. But it seems yeah. to me that the monarchia really completely takes the winds out of the sail, uh, sails exactly. of battle. Yeah. Now with John 17, 3, remember you're dealing with Muslims. So you want to do two things when you deal with Muslims. Show why that passage is not inconsistent with our belief in the Father, His eternal Son, His eternal Spirit, but show how that backfires against them. What do I mean? They'll quote John 17, 3. This is eternal life. They may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So my first question to Shabir would have been, who is the only true God here? The Father, the Son whom the Father glorifies in the same way that the Son glorifies Him, because that's verses 1 and 2. Just look at verses 1 and 2. Jesus looks up to heaven. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. It's reciprocal. So my question to Shabir would be, would the Muslim Isa ever claim to be the Son of God in such a way where God glorifies Him to the same extent that the Son glorifies God? Mm -hmm. Can a creature demand of the Creator glorify me so that i may glorify you it's not only reciprocal it's even condition you glorify me then i'll glorify you that's the first thing the second thing why don't you just read verse two shiver why'd you start at three it says that the father has given the son authority over all flesh mm -hmm. so that he may give everlasting life to all that he gives to him so two more questions shiver do you believe the son as a son is sovereign over all flesh so that he's sovereign over your prophet Muhammad so that Muhammad is beneath the feet of Jesus and Jesus <laughs> owns your prophet Muhammad? That's a great argument. Do you believe that? He Thirdly, what kind of attributes must the son have to be able to give a multitude of believers never-ending, yeah. immortal, morally incorruptible life? If that's not the attributes of God, I don't know what is. So if you read verses 1 or 2, Jesus is not saying the Father is the only true God to the exclusion of the Son, but in union with the Son. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity, Shabir. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything exactly. the Father does, the Son does in like manner. Yeah. Amen. No creature can save Now be baptized. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, I, and it showcases, yeah, again, it showcases the monarchy of the Father, but also the Trinity. So it's a... It's a Mm -hmm. It's a double shot, basically. It's it's an amazing sequence of verses. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful, powerful, especially verse five. Which creature could say to the Father, and now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the, glo with the glory glory I had alongside of you before the world began. No yeah. angel can say that, but the Son can. Right. Well, a Muslim can't say that either because they can't call God Father either. So when yeah. they try to cite that as an authentic text uh, <laughs> of Jesus speaking, then that's also that there's just multiple problems with that's this. Something I don't, I don't get. I mean, all through the through the New Testament, God is referred to as a Father, and Jesus is referred to as the Son of God, and it seems like. They really don't want to yeah. use that language, but in what sense are you authenticating the Gospels? Mm -hmm. If you take out some, there, there's absolutely no way you could get rid of all of those references. Yep. Sam, I have a question in regard to this. This one of the areas I wanted to kind of throw a curveball at him that, that I didn't think he would expect because I heard him in old debates. He would say, "Oh, Matthew five, Jesus says." Uh, not one jot or tittle will pass away. <laughs> so I was really interested in how he would account for continuity between all those things given in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy that apply to you know Jewish law, ceremonies, yeah. temple, sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and he sort of just fell back on that. Well, it's all corrupted, 
Well, yeah. but uh, now we've got all those statements in you know the surahs that say that the, it wasn't; it was given to the Jews. And so I was really looking for him to account for the discontinuity, which he used in many other older debates would throw against Christians. You guys don't do the ceremonial laws, blah 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 blah. So I wanted to hear him explain continuity. I don't think he ever did, but is there even a better answer from Muslims on this question of continuity, which they always throw at us? Here's the problem with Shabir. When he brought that argument, it's not again he's looking for consistency or he being honest in his approach. He's trying to shake up the faith of a Christian he, because he doesn't care what Matthew 5 says. Because if you press on, press him on it, he'll say what he said. Well, we don't know if the historical Jesus actually said those words. So then why are you quoting it? He'll say, I'm quoting it for your benefit to show you what Jesus said in the, in the gospel of Matthew that you believe is historical and how it conflicts with Paul because he likes to pit Paul against Jesus. Paul said, you know, that we're not justified by the works of the law. And yet Jesus commands his followers to obedience to the law, even with the rich man. So then he said, okay, Shabir, are you going to be consistent here? Because if Jesus is calling people to uphold the law, does Muhammad uphold the law? Of course he doesn't. So then what does he say? Well, I, I don't believe Jesus said it. You do. So I'm showing you the conundrum you're in. How do you get out of it? So that that's what he would say, because he's not interested, again, in consistency. He's interested in getting Christians to doubt their faith and see the Bible's full of contradictions right, so they can right. walk away from Christianity and hopefully become Muslim. Is That's there, his goal in these debates. Right. But aside from Shabir, is there a better Muslim response to that question? What? It, how does the, the Islamic theology and tradition account for these vast numbers of ceremonies and laws and things that are given to said to be in perpetuity, which we would say... You know, it's the heavenly uh, uh, ceremony that is that is the liturgy modeled after. When when Moses went up on the mountain, he saw the images of what are in heaven, and he put that into the liturgy on earth by God's command, which we know was temporary. I'm just wondering if they have any kind of uh, sensible apologetic account, because I, again, not really. I've not had that much experience debating Muslims, but they seem to really have no explanation for what the significance or purpose of the temple and its ceremonies was. There isn't really a very good, consistent argument on their part because Muhammad puts them in a conundrum because obviously Muhammad doesn't follow in the footsteps of the prophets. You don't see the priesthood, the necessity of vicarious sacrifices and so on and so forth. So they know that the message of the Quran as it stands is in conflict with the Bible. So their only recourse is, well, the Bible's corrupt or they'll point to those passages which say, that God is not really interested in blood. And this yeah. is where they ape rabbinic Judaism and rabbinic Judaism's response to us Christians saying, see, the Old Testament commanded the shedding of blood for atonement. Where is the blood? You don't have a temple. Right. You don't have priesthood. And then they point to those portions of the Old Testament where it says, your sacrifices mean nothing to me and stop burning me with your burnt offerings and so on and so forth. So again, the Muslim who sees there's a contradiction between the Bible and the Quran and sees that Muhammad does not follow in the footsteps of the prophet, all he can say, unless he leaves Islam, is your Bible's corrupt. That's all he can say because he really doesn't have a good answer. Why the discontinuity? Okay, let's put the New Testament aside. Muhammad is the prophet like Moses, right? That's what you say. Why is it, unlike Moses, there isn't a priesthood? Why is it, unlike Moses, you don't have a sacrificial system? Why is it unlike Moses, you don't have a temple where priests officiate and offer? I thought he's the prophet like Moses. He is so dissimilar to Moses. Their only response is either he's a false prophet or your Old Testament's corrupt. That's all they can say. So, if, so here's the next I, question. The next question sorry. that I asked. I, just, I, I, I saw the doctor shaking his head like he's like shocked. Like, what? Yeah, <laughs> Jay, if I can just add on sure. to what Sam had just mentioned here. There is one other nuanced response that they could provide, and this is they're trying to establish the prophethood of Muhammad based on Abraham and their stress on Abraham, because this way it avoids them looking as if Muhammad is like the succession, like you have Moses, David, Christ, and so on, that culminates in Muhammad. Yes, they claim that the final prophethood or the message does culminate with Muhammad, but they try to avoid this problem to bypass the entire Judaic root by going right to Abraham and claiming that is what gives them the substance that 
Muhammad can now claim um, the succession. And so with Abraham, you did not have the temple, you did not have the sacrifices, you just had this simple Hanif, right. this simple monotheistic belief system. So I'm just kind of saying like that's one of the arguments that they could the possibly... You respond to them saying, which Abraham? The Abraham of the Quran or Abraham of the Hebrew Bible? Because Abraham was the priest of his household. He functioned... Exactly. As the exactly. And, and offerings. Yeah. He and this, sacrifices. Uh, Everywhere he went, he built an altar to Jehovah with sacrifices yeah. because the head of the house would function as the priest of that house and yeah. offer sacrifices because that was his duty as yes. the patriarch as the head of the household right yeah so all they all they end up doing with that argument is they just shift it down one notch but you still have the same problem because exactly as i as you just yeah, said so this is the question yeah. i'll let you go snack after this but so what i really wanted to get at that i don't think that system can answer is that the Quran doesn't provide the epistemic criteria to know which texts are actually corrupted and which ones work yeah. because it actually affirms both, right? It affirms, oh, we gave the covenant, we gave the book, we gave the law, we gave the Psalms of David, we gave all this stuff. And then it turns around and says, oh, but actually gigantic portions, maybe 50, 60, 70% are actually corrupted and made up. So that makes no sense. I just feel like that's the Achilles heel to the whole thing. That's why I've never really honestly taking it very taking islam very seriously because it's just like if you go to actual textual criticism like i mean sure there's variant manuscripts and whatever but but not on the level that that it seems like islam requires like they would just require massive like you're saying just yeah. massive portions of the text like all of leviticus corrupt. basically <laughs> You don't see that in even the most extreme liberal scholarship. Like no one would yeah. say that no, all of that stuff was yeah. you know, corrupt. The only do, doctor, the only appeal would be that even liberal scholarship says the Pentateuch does not come from Moses. It comes from the documentary hypothesis mm -hmm. for different strands. You know, the J source and the P source, and mm -hmm. the, they'll say so. So even scholarship says it's not from Moses. So why should I but, believe? But then, that? I mean, like, at that point, it's like, okay, well, then the prophecy about the prophet that yeah. will come, right. they will appeal right. to you, like, well, so should I just decide that wasn't authentic? Yeah. I mean, and I mean, at way, a certain point, you just, you, you're yeah. cutting, you know, you're, you're cutting you're your own. It. Yeah, exactly. and, 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 and gigantic portions of the Psalms refer to the Levitical ceremonies and to the temple worship and to yeah. the tabernacle, and gigantic portions of the prophets refer to that, so it it becomes this whole Pandora's yeah. box that just yeah. explodes. Yeah, it's a conundrum, you know. Yeah. The famous verse that they try to bring up, because there's one verse that says Mohammedin, something like this. Um, uh, say, oh, oh, Mohammed is, is announced here. It, it comes from the Song of Solomon, which they described as pornographic and therefore <laughs> corrupted. Yeah. So yeah. ultimately, and this yeah. was, um, this, this is a great point. Uh, they don't know to which sources... Uh, <laughs> Because they can refer themselves, and you, and you can see throughout the debate is the position of Shabir Ali has been shifting constantly. At first, he wants to pit John against the other uh, evangelist. Then he wants to pit Paul uh, to pit Paul against everybody else. And then he says that no, you know, still Paul is is, do, is doing all right. Uh, the problem was was when it was changed uh, by Constantine. So then he, he reverts to, uh, to 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 other arguments. Um, he will appeal to the rabbis. I, I'm, I'm, I really would like to 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 listen to what the rabbis have to say about Christ, about Mary, uh, about him being the Messiah. If that's compatible with uh, with Islam, I would like to say about Muhammad. So is he is shifting his arguments, and that's that's not coherent as a whole. You you cannot appeal to the rabbis. You cannot try to create. Um, um, fights in between Christian tradition. We you even st start to see some some Muslim who are appealing to the Aryans. Aries didn't believe that Muhammad, like there would be a, a new prophet to come. He didn't believe yeah. that you don't need um, the, the church, you don't need sacrifices, you don't need yeah. stuff like this. So they're, they're really lost because they come after everybody else and they try to, to pick up whatever works for them. But um, And that's that's why your analysis, Jay, is, is very, very interesting because single arguments, when they are single doubts, they can make sense, but as a whole, they never make sense. And, and I want to bring my experience with people talking about the, the ceremonial law. Uh, Entry-level Muslim will often come to Christians and say, oh, look, look at the law, look at the law of Leviticus, you, you, you have a lot of things to do and so on. And you have a, um, like, uh, and basically they will say, oh, we don't eat pork and we're circumcised and, and, and you eat pork and you're circumcised. And, and then they will completely yeah. forget about all the rest. And they yeah, say, oh, yeah. you see, like, you, you didn't oppose the law, but we don't oppose the law either. Um, and about the priesthood, I've seen some, but 
more westernized Muslims that start to say that, yeah, it's mourning to Abraham and it's uh, uh, it's a Melchizedek uh, priesthood that all Muslim practices when they are, you know, slaughtering um, yeah. uh, slaughtering an animal for the aid. But, uh, you know, even when they are claiming that the, the Kaaba was built by Abraham, uh, Abraham this is a big problem because it was built for ceremonial, <laughs> for for ceremonial purposes supposedly. Mm-hmm. That that's what Abraham built everywhere. So they are, All right. they, they are, they are you know, that. just rolling mm-hmm. around. Uh, I mean, it's a pagan temple. We know it historically, but if you follow the Muslim narrative, they are just turning around an empty temple. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. If I can yeah. just speak to Sam's point yeah. that he mentioned about the documentary hypothesis and the four versions and so on. I'd like to add on as well when you're done. Yeah. yeah. So for, for me, from my perspective, we don't even need to go that far. It, there is in the Quran this biblical subtext so that a lot of the narrations or the narratives that you see appear in the Quran, they're just either mentioned by name passively. There's sometimes you don't even have any kind of explanation entailing what it is exactly that they're talking about. There is an assumption on the reader that they are already familiar with the stories of the Old Testament, of the Psalms, of the um uh, of the New Testament, of the stories of the Gospels, so that when it, this, the mere mention of them is made to the Muslims, they already know what all that stuff entails. And so then the issue that I, I would then ask the Muslim is, if you do not have, if you treat the entire text of the Old Testament and New Testament as corrupt, let's just say it's all corrupt, so it there's no reason why whatsoever you would even read it. Tell me by the Quran, what is the Torah? What is the Injil? Why isn't it called Torah version 1, Torah version 2? Where is the distinction? Are you telling me that if we look strictly at the Quranic conception of Christ, of Jesus, if you take away everything that is in common with the Old Testament and New Testament, the only thing that you're left with that Jesus is in the Quran is somebody who performs miracles. Does yeah. it, is, is, does somebody who waves his hands to perform miracles warrant a new scripture, the Injil? So you as a Muslim, without once looking at the New Testament or the Old Testament, tell me from the Quran what exactly is the Injil. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to add on to this is one of, one of the <clears throat> one of the big clinches for me, which is sometimes overlooked, but not always, is like just just think about it. The the apologetic here is so radically disconnected from the Quran and Muhammad. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, imagine you're a imagine you're a Jew or a Christian in the seventh century, <clears throat> and you have Muhammad coming proclaiming his prophethood, trying to convince you he's a prophet. What are you going to go by? You don't have, like Jay said, Wellhausen style critics <laughs> or any of this stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, to, do, to know what the authentic texts are and which aren't, I need to wait a thousand, over a thousand years <laughs> to get the critics to tell me that. Yes, no, all, all I have is the, the Torah and the angel. And as far as I know, it's authored by the received tradition. It's, it's authored by Moses or the X, Y, Z. So how are you supposed to just divorce your apologetics so much from from the, the original uh, narrative? It's, it's just wild to me. Yeah, so Jay, uh, if I'll just make uh, two final points and listen to the rest of you. Here's the two things I want people to walk away with. Number one, Shabir Ali, because it's about Shabir Ali. I want to highlight the inconsistency in that he said in the debate, <clears throat> When you start with Mark and you work way, your work, your way up to John, there's theological development so that you have a more human Jesus in Mark. And then you have the Arius Christ in John, because in John, he doesn't believe Jesus is the second person to God. But then at the same time, if you pay attention to his, to his arguments, he does argue Paul, which he believes predates the Gospels, did affirm that Jesus is divine and that his Christology is the same as John's Christology. So now he wants to have his cake and eat it too. You're telling me Paul, which is our earliest tradition, has a semi-divine Jesus, the first creation of God. 
And we end up with John affirming the same view. But then in between, somehow, Mark and Matthew Luke didn't get, I guess, uh, the letter and went to preaching a more human Jesus. And yet in other debates, we'll say that Mark, Matthew, Luke were written under the influence of Pauline theology. You see, so you see he's everywhere. First, Mark is a more human yeah, Jesus, point. but then Mark is influenced by Paul. And yet Paul does teach that Jesus is divine, the first creation of God, as does John. But John is later and more theologically developed. How can he be later and more theo theologically developed when you're admitting that Paul, our earliest witness, already holds the view of John? So this just tells you that Shabir is not interested in truth. Mm. He's not interested in consistency. He's interested in throwing everything and the kitchen sink against the Christian to get the Christian to doubt. And the second point I want to make, and I'm done. <clears throat> Notice, not only does the Quran downplay the necessity of vicarious sacrifice and the, the need for blood. For example, the only reference to the crucifixion of Christ is in chapter 4, verse 157. 4, 157, it says, they neither killed him nor crucified him, but it so appeared unto them. Now, what's even more astonishing? The story of Moses is repeated over and over and over again, and even reference to the plagues. The Quran makes reference to the plagues. But the one thing the Quran never mentions is the Passover. Is that ironic? Here you have the Passover, which is the slaughtering of a lamb, the eating the flesh, uh, the eating its flesh, not breaking its bone, taking the blood, mixing it with birds of hyssop, putting it on the top and the side of the doors, which signaled the redemption of Israel. The slaughtering of the lamb released them from their bondage to Egyptian slavery. And yet, Muhammad never once mentions the Passover, which was the heart of the Exodus, which became the an annual, <clears throat> an annual feast of the Jews, not mention the Quran. It almost seems like there's something diabolical going behind the scenes and moving Muhammad to downplay, if not ignore, the necessity of sacrifice for redemption yes, and forgiveness. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great point. Very good point. Awesome. Sam, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, you can Everybody can follow Sam over at uh, his channel. I've got it linked below if you want to follow his streams where he covers a lot of this material, puts out a lot of content. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, thank we're you for having me. It's you. an honor to be with you guys. Sir, you guys, I love you guys. And keep praying for me for my journey. See where the Lord... Mm -hmm. His plans to yes. take Sa Sam streams on the intercession of saints. So good. <laughs> Are you heard that? Huh? Yeah. So good. <laughs> thank you, man. Thank you. And uh, we want to thank everybody for joining us, Dr. Bo Branson. Uh, I've got his uh, uh, link below as well to the um, Monarchia of the Father, his lecture series on that, as well as his. You can find his other uh, uh, works and lectures and papers there as well. <clears throat> and then I've got David linked below. David the Real Medwai, thank you for your comments. So we've got uh, Kai linked at the Orthodox Shahada, and we've got um, uh, Dr. Ananias as well below his internet uh, craft out. So he said uh, thank you for having him as well. And I think that's everybody. Did I forget anybody? Uh, Snack, I think Snack has the French server. So you guys can, I'll put Snack's uh, Twitter if you guys want to follow him for the French yeah. Orthodox debates that they do. And, uh, Thank you guys. It was great. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Jay. Risen. Risen indeed. He is truly risen. Amen. We love you, Lord Jesus.